So hello and welcome everyone to our Find Your Ancestors session for today. I'm Katie Stilp. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library in Appleton, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we dive into our program, I just have a couple quick announcements. First, a huge thank you to the Friends of the Appleton Public Library for providing funding for our Find Your Ancestors series and continuing to allow us to bring amazing speakers every month. We definitely could not do this without their support. Uh, for those unfamiliar with our series, the Find Your Ancestors series happens once a month, every month of the year. So check out the handout. Um, I've posted the link in the chat, and again, it's on your reminder email. On that first page of the handout, we've got some information on our upcoming programs with links to register for them. So our next session is going to be Saturday, November 9th, all about using Social Security records for breaking down those brick walls that you might have. So come learn about that. Then we're going to wrap up our year on December 14th by diving into your family's medical history. That's been something that a lot of people have asked us to do a program on, so I'm looking forward to that one for sure. Um, so again, there's registers to link or register. There's links to register for those programs in the handout. Uh, there's also a link to our events calendar where you can keep an eye on it for our 2025 series topics to be announced hopefully soon. Uh, we also have another great genealogy series that the library does. Um, it's a collaboration with Thompson Center on Lords, which is our local senior center. So those sessions are geared more towards those beginners who are just starting their journey or who want to learn some of the more basic things. Uh, so for those who live locally, you can join us at Thompson Center, but we also live stream those on Zoom and that's open to everyone. Those sessions are the fourth Tuesday of every month at one o'clock central. Our next session is going to be on October 22nd. We're going to be talking all about researching those probate records and the awesome genealogical things you can find in those. Uh, and then in November, we're going to talk all about land records. So again, check out the links in the handout to sign up for that series. And we do record those and post them on YouTube if you aren't able to attend those live. Same with our Find Your Ancestors series. If you've missed any of our past sessions, uh, there's a link in the handout to our YouTube channel where you can look at some of the past recordings. Of course, not every presentation is recorded or up there indefinitely, so be sure to register and attend live if you're able to. We are recording today's session. I'll send out a link uh, to that recording on Monday, um, and you'll be able to watch that if you've missed any of it or want to rewatch parts of it. Just a quick reminder that recording or capturing this presentation in any format without permission from our speaker and the library is prohibited. All the slides and handout materials are covered by copyright law, so you're welcome to download and or print a copy of it for your personal use, but no portion of any material may be photographed, duplicated, or shared in any way without permission from our speaker. If you have any questions during today's session, feel free to use the Q&A box located in the bottom of your screen and we'll answer those questions at the end. If you've got any library specific questions or need help navigating any of our library's genealogy databases, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is on that first page of the handout. And then finally, once we close out of the session today, a short survey is going to pop up. If you could just take a minute to fill it out, let us know what you thought of today's presentation. We would greatly appreciate it. There's also a spot where you can let us know what future topics you'd like us to tackle in our Find Your Ancestors sessions. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. We're excited to welcome back Tina. Tina is the order the owner of Tamarack Genealogy and is also the Genealogy Local History Librarian at the Plainfield P Public Library in Plainfield, Illinois. She lectures extensively on topics including genealogical methodology, military research, and archival preservation. She's a member of the Genealogical Speakers Guild and the Association of Professional Genealogists, as well as the first VP of the Illinois State Genealogical Society and board secretary and director for the Oswego Heritage Association. She volunteers her time with several historical and genealogical societies across Illinois, and she's provided research assistance for nearly 20 years and has been researching her own family history uh, as time permits for over 30 years. She's also a very avid baseball fan, as we were just talking about before we uh, jumped on today. So everyone, welcome back, Tina. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, everybody, for being on today. It's a pleasure to be back, and I'm glad you could be here on such a 
what's beautiful here in Illinois, and it seems like beautiful in some parts of your areas as well. So I am going to turn my camera off, one, to preserve bandwidth so I don't glitch out on you, and two, so that you can see my screen a little bit better, so that you don't have my little talking head, because those who know me know I talk a lot with my hands and I don't want to be a distraction. Um, and I will turn it back on when we get to the Q&A as well. So we are going to talk about records that are available at the National Archives facility known as the National Personnel Records Center. So these are collections that I have utilized. They're collections that are available to the public that you can request documents for. But before we talk about the process of viewing records collections at the National Archives, especially in St. Louis. I want to just give you a little bit of background about how the National Archives as a whole, as a system, you might have heard the term NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, is responsible for over 25 regional facilities around the country. So they have what they consider to be their three main hubs or their three main archives, and those would be the National Archives, we call it one for short. So the National Archives one, which is in Washington, D.C. That's where the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are on display. That's where you're going to find early military documents up until 1914. So if you're looking for Revolutionary War, Spanish-American War, War of 1812, Civil War, those records are at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Then there's a subset of collections that are at what are called Archives 2, which is in College Park, Maryland, and they are connected by shuttle. So if you are at Archives 1 in D.C., you can hop on the shuttle and it'll take you out to College Park, Maryland. It's about a 40-minute bus ride. And what Archives 2 has are unit records and collections related to modern military engagements. So they would have records from 1914 to the present, but instead of being individual personnel files like they have in St. Louis, these are going to be unit records and company records. So if I'm researching Ira Jones, and Ira Jones is um, in the 313th Engineers during the First World War, his individual personnel file is going to be in St. Louis, where I can find out if he had received any promotions, if he was in the hospital, when he was discharged. His unit records are going to live in two places. Stateside records, so basic training, everything leading up to getting on board the ship to go over to France, are in Washington, D.C. Once somebody gets on board that ship and travels overseas, whether it's for the First World War, the Second World War, whether we're talking about Korea or Vietnam, as soon as they get on board that ship or that plane to take them overseas, those records are at College Park. So there's three distinct places that you're going to visit for information about your ancestors or veterans' military service. Stateside records or all records leading up to 1914 are in Washington, D.C., Overseas records from 1914 to the present are in College Park. And then the individual record for my soldier, sailor, or nurse after 1914 are going to be in St. Louis. But then there are additional pieces to that puzzle as well. So these regional facilities represent collections based on uh, assortment of nearby states. So I'm just outside of Chicago. In Chicago, we have the Chicago Great Lakes Regional Archive, which represents the seven states surrounding Lake Michigan. So that would be Wisconsin and Minnesota and Illinois and um, Ohio. What am I missing? I'm missing one state in there. Iowa, I think might be in there. That camps and bases. So when we think about Fort Sheridan or Great Lakes Naval Base or, or places like that, those camp records, like the day-to-day -day of, of running the military base, are in those regional facilities. So I'm going to talk in just a few minutes about CCC records, civilian records, so people who were in the um, Civilian Conservation Corps or people who worked for the WPA, those records, their personal employment records are in St. Louis. But if I wanted to know more about the camp that my grandfather was stationed in while he was um, involved in the CCC, those records are at those regional facilities. So if I'm looking for hospital records nationwide, 
for military engagements, those records are in Kansas City. So there's nuances to where the collections are based on those hubs and those regional campuses as well. So not everything is in one place. There are billions upon billions of pages of documents that the National Archives is responsible for maintaining. So they put collections in places where they have the space to house them indefinitely. So things even move from time to time. So all bankruptcy records across the country were moved to Kansas City and all World War II draft cards were moved to Atlanta. So they just move things around to make room um, to be able to house specific collections. But when we talk about personnel records, whether it's civilian personnel, people who worked for the federal government, whether that's postmasters, whether that's um, forest um, services, those records are in St. Louis and you can request those. And I'll talk about those more in just a second. Now, modern veterans records from 1914 to 1962 are available and can be requested Um to either be mailed or viewed in person in St. Louis. And National Archives will seal records on a 62 year rolling calendar. So 62 years from today. So I can request records from October 12th, 1962. Monday, I can request, request records up to October 14th, 1962. It's a 62 year rolling calendar. So if you had somebody who was in military service during that time period, but they had not left the service by October of 1962, then those records are still at the National Archives in St. Louis, but they have not been moved out of the records um, management collection to the archives. There's two distinct buildings where quote unquote modern records that are sealed are kept on one half of the building. And then records that have been made available, declassified and moved to the archives are on the other side. So if you had somebody who was still in service and they didn't they didn't come out of the service until let's say 1964, then those records are not available to the general public yet. And they would become available to the general public as of that discharge date in 1964. So if you want to know a little bit more about how they divide these collections and what are accessible to the public and what aren't, in your handout you have the link to learn a little bit more about military service records that are available through the National Archives. You can request records that have been moved already that are on the National Archives side that are open to the public, they're past that 62 year window, and you can put in a, a request for those records directly through the National Archives website. So we're gonna talk about that for just a minute, and then we're gonna delve into, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna view these records in person. So if you go to the National Archives website, if you go to archives.gov, right across the header, you're going to see the tab for veteran service records. You can click on that record and it'll tell you a little bit about the types of records that the National Archives collects, the different databases that you can search for more information. And then at the very bottom of that page, there's a link that says request records online. And it'll call it'll call it eVet Rex, which is electronic veterans records. Now the people who are eligible to take advantage of eVet Rex are people who the federal government deems to be next of kin. So it could be you, it could be your parents, your children, it can be your siblings. It cannot be grandchildren, great-grandchildren, aunts or uncles, cousins, nieces and nephews. The federal government deems next of kin as being people who are within that immediate circle. If you are a widower or a widow and you have remarried, you are no longer considered next of kin. You're only considered next of kin if you are an unremarried widow or widower. So that's something to keep in mind. If you do meet that requirement and you are next of kin, then you have the ability to get an unredacted copy of those modern military files up to 1962 at no cost. If you are not next of kin, if you are the niece or the nephew, or you are the grandchild, you could do one of two things. You can get a redacted copy at a fee based on the number of pages, and that fee could be up to $75 depending on the size of the file. Or if you're close enough or have the desire, you can put in your request and you can view those documents in person at the National Archives in St. Louis. 
If you are viewing them in person, there's no cost for you to scan or photograph any document that you find within that collection. The only fee that you would face would be if you wanted them to make copies for you at the facility, or if you wanted to pay for that by mail and have that sent to you. So that's how you would find it if you did not want to drive to St. Louis or you didn't have the luxury to come down to St. Louis to visit in person. For everything else that I'm gonna talk about for the remainder of our hour are going to be those records collections that you are going to view in person. You are going to make the trip, you are going to request the records and you are gonna view them in the facility. So now the NPRC houses records for civilian and military personnel Again, those start in 1914. There's a little gray area there where there are records collections that neither the National Archives in DC or St. Louis seems to be able to find. And they're military records based around um, US military engagements along the border, the Mexican border chasing Pancho Villa. I'm trying to find these records myself. They're not at the National Archives. They're not at St. Louis. They're in this weird gray area where people aren't sure what happened to those collections. So hopefully for you, you do not have military uh, series that you're requesting that fall into that 1912 to 1914 gray area. World War I records are pretty cut and dry and they do have a, a portion of those at the National Archives in St. Louis. Now, why do they only have a portion? There was a fire in the 1970s that destroyed a huge portion of that collection. I'm going to talk about that next in just a moment. But you can submit a request to the National Archives in St. Louis, to the National Personnel Records Center. I included not just with my handout today, but there were three forms that were in there for you. One of them is to request civilian records and OMPFs, which I'm going to talk about. Those are the official military personnel files. The other one is their general reference slip. And that's going to be for the other collections that I talk about today. I'm going to talk about burial transfers. I'm going to talk about individual deceased persons files. I'm going to talk about court marshals. You would use that second form. And I'm going to show you what they look like so you have an idea of how you're filling it out to request documents. And then the third are some additional collections that are, I want to say, new, quote unquote, new to the National Archives in St. Louis, and that would be things like their Merchant Marine records. So I'm going to touch just briefly on Merchant Marines records because people assume that they're a, a branch of the federal government military service. They are not. They were originally um, part of the Department of Commerce because it related to maritime law. Um, so they're a relative newcomer to the records that are at the National Archives in St. Louis. I can request my documents. I can fill out that form. I can submit it to them. They will not give me a date to come down and view records until all of the files that I have requested have been found, processed, and now are available for me to view in person. That can take a few weeks. That can take several months. If any of you remember during COVID, just the immense backlog that the National Archives was under because their facilities were closed. They were running a deficit. They had nearly 400,000 military service records requests that they had to catch up and fill. And luckily, the new archivist of the United States increased the budget so that money could go into hiring additional staff to get these files processed. And I'm delighted to say that they are nearly caught up so if you are one of those people and you put in a request months and months and months ago and you hadn't gotten a response yet, just rest assured they are working on it. They are trying to catch up on that just enormous backlog that they had due to COVID in 2020. So if you're submitting requests now, if after today you think I've got three or four of these records I want to submit, I want to go down in person and I want to view these the wait for you probably will not be anywhere near as long as it was for some of us. But keep in mind too, that they do have a threshold. So they're not going to let you request more than 10 to 12 documents at a time. And that's just simply because of the processing that's involved of getting those documents pulled and ready for you. The good news in all of this is once you've made your initial request and you've viewed your first set of documents, you kind of get fast-tracked 
and you don't go to the end of the line. So if I request 10 documents, I go down and I view them in person, I can submit another request for another 10 or however many more that I need up to that threshold. And those records will get pulled quicker. It'll still take a few weeks. It won't be immediate and you won't be able to come back the next day or the next week. But because you've already visited, you already have your researcher card, you've already been vetted in our in the system, you'll receive that email that your records are ready quicker than if you were starting from scratch for the very first time. You do need to have a researcher card in order to access any of the archives facilities. So what they would do is if you've not visited before, they will send you a link to a video and a series of PowerPoints that you'll watch online. You'll take a a tiny test. It maybe takes five to 10 minutes, basically recapping the things that you just read, how to properly handle documents, what types of records do they have available that you can access there. You'll take that test and it'll kind of provide you with a certificate saying, congratulations, you have passed the, the research request. And you'll get an email saying, you know, congratulations, we'll let you know when your records are ready and you'll be able to schedule an appointment. Now, all of their appointments have now been moved to Eventbrite, and there are two types of, of time slots. There are two types of appointments you, you can make. One is textual research, which are the collections I'm gonna talk about today, whether you're looking at civilian records or military records. And the other type of appointment is for access to the microfilm and their um, library. The microfilm and access to the book collection do not require um, an appointment, does not require approval in advance. If you're just going to look at their microfilm reels, you can schedule your appointment and you can go down and visit once you've done your research um, card requirements. For those of you who are, are requesting textual documents, you'll have to wait until they email you to say, yes, all of your materials are here. They'll tell you in your material, in your request, what was unavailable, whether they couldn't find anything based on the information you provided, the materials were too fragile, they're, they can't be copied, or yes, they're here and they're accessible for you. So you'll know in advance how many are ready for you. And then you can go into Eventbrite, pick your day and make your appointment to come down. You have to do this on your own. If you're going to bring a partner with you, they need to request their own records and they have to sit at their own table. You're not allowed to share space. So you could come down together once you're both approved, but you'd be looking at, sec at, at um, separate textual documents. You would not be able to share those records. You are allowed to bring cameras. You're encouraged to bring cameras. You can bring flatbed scanners. Um, there are certain types of scanners like those handheld ones that would require you to brush against the document. Those are not permitted, but flatbed scanners are acceptable. They have camera stands. So if you're using a camera that you can screw into like a, a camera stand, or if you're using a phone, they have um, plexiglass that you can rest your phone on so that you can photograph the documents. Again, if you want to make your own photocopies while you're there, it's 25 cents. If you want them to make photocopies while you're there, it's 80 cents to cover the staff intervention that's needed. If you bring your own records with you, like if you bring your laptop, that's perfectly fine. But if you bring loose papers with you, all of those need to be stamped and accounted for. They go into a sealable, a lock sealable bag that um, you take to the archivist once you exit the room. They open it, they review it and then they give you your documents. And that's just to make sure that nobody is trying to steal anything or walk off with any documents, which had been a, a problem in, in some facilities. So I'm gonna talk about civilian employment records just briefly because I want you to be aware that this is not just military, that there are a lot of additional things that are available through the civilian employment records that they had. Like I said, if you had somebody who was postmaster, if you had somebody who was a census taker, if you had somebody you know, who was a firefighter in a national park or worked for the National Park Service, those are government jobs. And people who are civilian employees of the government create paperwork that is collected at the National Archives and those records are in St. Louis. Now, some of these records collections were sampled, so they do not have 100% of the 
um, National Park Service employee records, but they have a portion of those records. And certain collections are sampled more heavily than others. But you would be able to put in a request and ask if they have those personnel files. So I'm going to show you a personnel file from my grandmother. She had worked for Army Purchasing during the Second World War. I reached out to them, gave them all the information I had on her service, where she worked, details about when she worked for the government. And sure enough, they had her entire packet. Did the same thing for my grandfather on my other side. He worked in Nitro, West Virginia at the nitroglycerin plant during the First World War. They have no record of him. So it's not guaranteed that there's going to be something, but it's, it's worth taking the time to see if you can find it. If you are the employee, you can reach out to the National Archives and ask for an unredacted file. If you are a civilian and you're requesting these and it's not you're not the person, then again, just like with the paperwork that you're asking to be mailed to you for military service, those files will be redacted. But if you go in person, you should be able to see the entire unredacted file. And then other types of records that are there as well, like the Civilian Conservation Corps records, those are there. So I'm going to show you a copy of my grandfather's um, application and uh, paperwork associated with him being a member of the CCC in the 1930s. They also have records for people who worked for the Works Progress Administration. So those people who painted murals, those people who went in and did cemetery inventories and you know, the writer's project, those records are available to you um, through the National Archives in St. Louis. And I give you both of those record request form numbers so that you can request them for more information. So here is my grandpa. So what I love about this story is that my grandfather and his siblings had undergone a very tragic event when they were in their teens. And the boys scattered after their father was murdered. And the boys scattered all across the country. My grandfather, who was the youngest boy at the time, was not of legal age to join the CCC. You were supposed to be 18 years old. So my grandfather enlisted in the CCC as his brother, Joseph. So in his first set of CCC paperwork, he applies as Joseph Stanley Tatara. That's not my Uncle Joe. That's my grandfather. And there are two dead giveaways going through these files. And what cracks me up about this is, one, I recognize my grandfather's signature. That's how he signs his, his our last name. There's no doubt about it that, that that was him signing the form. But when you become a member, when you get accepted into the CCC, it was just like joining the military. So they take your height, your weight, your hair color, any identifying features. Do you have scars or, or disabilities or moles or anything that they should be aware of? And on my grandfather's application as Joseph Stanley Tatara, he says that he's, you know, 63 inches tall and he weighs 114 pounds. My grandfather was five inches shorter than his brother. So when his brother, Joseph, does apply on his own two years later, because he had to wait for my grandpa to stop using his name, all of a sudden... He's, you know, 68 inches tall and 156 pounds. There's no way that anybody's going to grow that much or gain that much weight. But then my grandfather ups under his own name and he's, you know, 64 inches tall and he weighs 121 pounds. A lot more likely. So it's it's fun that I can look at these records and I recognize the discrepancy. But there's a lot of family history in here. It gives me my Uncle Joe's exact name and date of birth. It tells me who his mother is and what her address is. This this house still stands. This two flat in on the west side of Chicago still stands. All right, it tells me where he is stationed. So at first they send him to Fort Sheridan, and then he gets sent to Michigan to help build um, the Great Michigan Highway in Michigan. And tells me a little bit of information about his time there that... You know, he had received a life-saving certificate, that he had taken aquatic school training, that there was a lot of additional things that he had done during his time that he was stationed up, you know, in Michigan from April to, to May of 1936. So these files are really cool. A lot of people don't think to access these. But then if I wanted to know more, if I wanted to see if I could find additional records about him and his time in Michigan, then I would look at the National Archives in Chicago and see what types of information they had about Camp, um, Camp Wayne 
and I'd be able to go through those files in Chicago. So my grandfather was stationed out in Washington. When I was out in Seattle last year, I went to the National Archives in Seattle and was able to go through the camp newspapers and the camp files for the places where he was stationed just outside of Seattle. And you know, they were really insightful. The newspapers especially were um, particularly helpful and it let me know what was going on, what was daily life like for them out in the forest, you know, without any contact with the, you know, the urban public. So those are just a couple of examples of the types of things you can request. And like I had said, my my grandmother, my grandpa Casey's wife, Jenny, had worked for army purchasing. So when my grandparents got married in 1941, my grandfather did not go off and serve in the Navy until 1944. And he was gone from 1944 until March 9th of 1946. So my grandmother had worked for the government for five years. And at the time, if you were going to stay employed by the government, starting at the five-year mark, you were then going to have to wait to receive your pension until you were eligible to retire. So she would have had to have waited 40 years. But as soon as that five-year mark was rolling closer, she decided to resign from the military, from working for the army, and take any money that she was entitled to at that time. So in March of 1946, it includes every year they would do a, an efficiency rating. How proficient are you at your job? And you can see that in nearly everything, she excelled at the things that she did. She had gotten really high marks on her civil service exam, which was included in the file. It told me vacation requests that she had put in. Like, think about a typical employment file. But what I thought was delightful in her particular case was that my grandfather was discharged from the military March 9th of 1946. In July of 1946, she's already pregnant. My father is born exactly 40 weeks later, December 21st of 1946. And she is now a stay-at-home mom. But by the time she's writing her resignation letter announcing that her last day will be August 9th, she's already three months pregnant at this point. And her reason for leaving is the fact that she wants to stay home and be a housewife, which just delighted me. It just absolutely tickled me knowing that my dad was born six months later. So these are the kinds of things that you're going to find in that file. And yes, they might not be earth shattering. Yes, they might not... Um, tell you a lot of things that you didn't already know about your family. But it is kind of fun to just have those confirmations to be able to say, yes, this is her birthday. Now I have it without any doubt. Yes, I know that, you know, this is who she worked for. This is the address of the company. These are the types of things she did. Because, yes, we're genealogists. There's no doubt about that. But we're family historians. And we want to be able to put a little meat on the bone as to who they were and what they experienced in life. And having both of those files really helped me to do that. So after my gr grandfather comes home from the CCC, he works for several years and then decides that he is going to join the Navy. I talked a little bit about the fire that occurs at the National Archives facility in 1973. This fire burned so hot that it took four days of constant water being poured onto the fire to finally extinguish it. And while a lot of records were burned, the vast majority of the damage that came out of this particular fire was the water damage that happened after. So they have spent the last nearly 51 years now trying to kind of reconstruct or rehabilitate those records that weren't destroyed in the fire, but were severely damaged by flood water. So sadly, unfortunately for us, 80% of Army records from 1912, those ones that they did have, to 1960, were affected. 75% of Army Air Corps and Air Force records from 1947, because that's when the Air, Air Force starts, 1947 to 1964, are damaged. But luckily enough for us, Navy and Marine records were unaffected. They are in perfect condition. They were not in the same spot. They are full files without any, any injury. Like I had mentioned earlier, Coast Guard and Merchant Marine records were not held 
by the National Archives at that time. Um, they did not come to the National Archives until after the fact. So if you want to know a little bit more about Coast Guard or Merchant Marine records, feel free to take a screenshot of this because I, I didn't add it until after the fact, so it's not in your handout. But if you are specifically researching Coast Guard or Merchant Marine, I, I'm perfectly okay with you taking a screenshot of this. And I will leave this here for just a second so you can do that. Or again, just a Google search for archives.gov Merchant Marine. It's, it's gonna take you to this very same page. But because so many records were damaged in this fire, I'm sure probably dozens of us have submitted requests to the National Archives just to receive a letter back saying, we're sorry to tell you these were burn records, these were fire records, and they give you a form to fill out that says, please tell me everything you know about your veterans military service, to which I always kind of chortled to myself, well, if I knew I wouldn't be asking you for those records. But we can kind of recreate those records in the same way that they're gonna recreate those records. So again, looking for the unit records that are at Archives 1 or Archives 2, you know, looking at the military base records to see if there's any information about them at their military stations. They're looking at hospital records also that are in Kansas City. So they're using a variety of different um, other agencies that we could do that same thing as well. But if you're lucky enough that you submit a request and they do say, yes, we do have a file for you that is not a burn file, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be as robust as Navy or Marine records. Navy records can run you, you know, 60, 80 pages. There's a lot of, of detail to Navy records. They would include fingerprints, they would include photos, they would include things like um, the little log book that you were given that showed all of the, the ports of call and all of the dates that you had come into harbor. There's a lot more in Navy records than what are in Army records, unfortunately. Um, but we're going to talk about those. So we're going to talk about official military personnel files, OMPFs. We're going to talk about those who die in the line of, of duty. So we're going to talk about burial case files for World War I soldiers. We're going to talk about individual deceased persons files. Those are for World War II. I'll mention briefly court martial records. And then we're going to talk about those things that are on microfilm that you do not need to make a textual appointment for that you can go in and view anytime. Things like morning reports, muster rolls, daily sick logs, and things like that. And then that sheet that I gave you, that four-page sheet that has the collection number for Merchant Marine, it kind of tells you they only have two collections, so it's it's not the entire collection. Um, but you could also reach out to the U.S. Department of Com uh, Commerce or the National Archives for the Department of Commerce records as well in D.C. So OMPFs are those official military records. So that's going to keep track of enlistments, detachments if they're sent to another unit, any time spent in the hospital as a casualty, you know, their, their discharges from the military. All of that is going to be within the file. It's not necessarily going to include any medals that they might have been awarded. That's a separate sheet that sometimes is there, but not always. Um, and like I said, these are available on a 62-year rolling basis. So as of Monday, we could request records up to October 14th of 1962. While the official form number is 13173, the form that I gave you that has civilian on the right and military on the left is the form that you're going to submit to the St. Louis Archives in order to put in your initial request for records. And here's what that form looks like. So if I'm filling this form out for my grandmother, so if I wanted to know about Jenny's um, time as a civilian, that's going to be on the right. So I'm going to put, okay, Army purchasing. I'm going to put the dates that she worked for them. I'm going to put if I know the location where it was, that it was in Chicago, that it was at Navy Pier. Or if she moved and was working somewhere else, I would fill that in. I would put her name. I'd put my name first in my email address. If you have a researcher number already, you can put that in. They'll fill it in for you once you're assigned if you haven't done it yet. And then what do I know about her? Do I have, you know, her date and place of birth, her date and place of death? You know, do I have her social security number? And I can add that to the form. If I'm requesting military records, I'm going to do that on the left-hand side. So I'm going to put the branch of service that they're in, whether they were enlisted or if they were an officer. I'm going to put the general time period for the military engagement, World War I, 
World War II, Korea, right? I'm going to fill that in on the form. I can, it will ask you for date and place of death. It'll ask you for additional information. So parents' names, if you have the service number, you can put it in there in the top corner, the unit that they were in, maybe where they're stationed, whatever you know about them, you can add it into that file. Fill in as many fields as you possibly can. And the reason being is because we have a tendency to think that our names are unique and they are not. So for example, I requested records for my grandpa Casey. His official name was Casmer, K-C-A-S-M-E-R. Uh, no, I, he's not Casimir, he's Casmer Tatara. And lo and behold, there were two Casmer Tataras, one from Chicago and one from Connecticut. So no matter how unique you think your name is, that they're not John Smith, you could get the file for the wrong person if you don't provide enough information. So more is definitely more. If you have their service number, use that. If you have their, their state of birth, date of birth, place of death, state of death, make sure you include that on the form. Once you submit that, they will look for those records and reach out to you if they can be found. Then they have what are called PEP records, which are people of exceptional prominence. They're celebrities. And there's a link on the National Archives website, and you have this in your handout, where, you know, I can look for, you know, people like Jimmy Stewart. I can look for people like Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. Um, I was doing a little bit of research on the CWS, which is the Chemical Warfare Service during, during the First World War. And it's a unit that included Ty Cobb, Christy Mathewson, my personal favorite baseball player of all time, and as colonel of their unit, Branch Rickey. And I don't expect you necessarily to know who any of those three people are, but will I, what I will say is that Branch Rickey went on to um, be the person to break the color barrier. He was the person in the Dodgers um, admin that hired Jackie Robinson. Um, so Branch Rickey had a very illustrious career after his military service. Um, when he was a ball player before his military service, he was um, he was okay. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. But I wanted to do more research on this unit because all of them were in that unit together. Um, and the fun thing was that Branch Rickey and Christy Mathewson were in the PEP. Ty Cobb was not, which was bizarre to me. So I was able to request Ty Cobb's records because no nobody had thought to include him in these records. Um, but you'll find some interesting interesting people in the the PEP list. Um, so it's it, it's fun to to go and look at these. Some of these are already digitized and they're already available through the archives website, so you don't have to request them. One of the ones I did request, because like I said, I'm a big baseball fan, is I have the Navy service record for um, Vin Scully, who was the announcer of the Dodgers for generations. So he's listed in the PEP as well. So I've I've submitted my request. They contacted me to let me know that these records were available for me. So I go down to St. Louis and they give you one record file at a time. If you find records that still have staples or brads or something else, you have to take them back to the desk and they will remove them. They don't want you trying to remove staples on your own just because of how fragile the materials are. But they're going to give you the entire unredacted file. So anything that is in their military file is going to be included in this. So it could be... You know, they're again, their enlistment papers. It can be promotions that they might receive. It could be um, special orders. They're transferred from one unit to another. They go on furlough because dad's ill and they've got to go home. So they're given a seven day furlough. All of those kinds of things would be included within the file. And then their discharge papers. And occasionally you don't find it in every file. But occasionally, if any of you recall back in the 1980s when Ronald Reagan was president, he sent out a letter to every um, serviceman who had served in the Second World War, basically saying thank you and including a, a miniaturized copy of their um, discharge certificate. You'll find those in these files occasionally as well. So this particular one, like I said, Navy records and Marine records are really robust and there's a lot of information in them. This particular one is for um, Hugh Vernon Craig. And I can see all of the ports of call, all of the places where the ship that he was stationed on were docked and how long that it had um, 
it had been at port and, you know, a little bit of information, you know, that they were there, you know, less than a month, you know, that he was on board, you know, at first he was on board the Alabama and then he switched to the Sac City and gives me a little bit of information about, you know, what, was he a good service member or did he get in trouble a lot? And, you know, he, he gets all good marks. You know, he was a good boy. He didn't get in too much trouble, trouble while he was on leave. Some additional files that you're going to find in this type of paperwork, and this is going to be pretty much true, whether it's Army or Navy, you know, they're going to kind of keep track of height and weight, eye color, hair color, any distinguishing features, whether or not you're wearing glasses. And then you'll find information in there about family, because there'll be an insurance sheet in there saying, if anything happens to me, please pay my insurance too. And it could be their wife, it could be their parents, and it's going to give you their home addresses. So you're going to have additional information on there. When Hugh joined the service, um, it tells me that at the time, his dad was living in Emporia, Kansas, and it tells me his father is Andrew Craig. And then he moves while Hugh is still in military service and moves from Emporia, Kansas to Argentine, just outside of Kansas City. And his address in Emporia is crossed out and his address in Argentine in Kansas City is written in in its place. So some really cool information. If I didn't know that Andy had moved while his son was in service, I now have that information just because of his service records that are included in his file. That's just an example. Here's a couple of other things that are in there. The dates that he was in service, how long he was in service, who the next of kin is responsible if anything happens to him. So Mrs. Edith Hazel Craig is listed as his next of kin, which is his wife, tells me that he's born on July 17th, 1894. Why does that matter? Because Kansas and Nebraska don't start keeping vital records for births and deaths until 1910 and 1911. So he's giving me an exact date of birth before this is officially recorded or kept by the state of Kansas. So it's giving me another piece of vital information that I might not be able to find through a government source. It's giving me the place, you know, where he's living and where he's born and then basically how much he's being paid as part of his military service. So there's there's a lot of information that's available and it's always worth it to apply for an OMPF because even if they come back and say, we're sorry, this is a fire record, there's only three pieces of information that are in that file. The first sheet is basically the, if you remember the old um, Microsoft 1960s cards, cardboard cards that you would insert into the computer that would have his name and his service number. It will include if he had been in the hospital for any reason. It won't tell you why he's in the hospital. It'll just include a category, you know, stomach illness, foot, you know, a generalization. It doesn't tell you exactly what it's for. And then their discharge information, their final, what's called the final payment voucher. So this particular one, this one is for um, J.P. Craig, um, his cousin who was in the army at the time of his discharge, as people were returning, this is in world war one, as people were coming back and being discharged um, from overseas service. If you came back outside of your unit, then you would be lumped together in groups, a hundred, 500, a thousand, and you'd be discharged as that unit. So when he comes back, he's being discharged in bulk he gets grouped into the second company discharge detachment. That unit does not exist. All it was designed to do was keep track of the number of men who are being discharged out, out of Camp Grant at this particular point in time. If you see something that says casual unit, like 10th casual unit, it means that they came back separate from their unit because they had been in the hospital. Now we don't know why they're in the hospital. We don't know if they had the flu. We don't know if they were wounded or if they had some other type of injury or illness. But anytime you're looking at these final payment vouchers, if it says casual unit, you're gonna be looking for hospital records. If it says discharge detachment, it means they came back separate from their unit for some reason and they were discharged in bulk. So it's just terminology to be aware of when you're looking at these. And there was really nothing else in J.P. Craig's 
military file because it had been a fire record. So it took me years to finally figure out exactly what unit he was actually in. And I found it in a county history that was from Kane County, Illinois, talking about the boys who had served. And it told me the unit that he was in. And then I was able to reach out and look through those unit records at College Park. So I eventually found it, but it, this was absolutely no help in that quest. Here's another example. This is a third cousin. This is for Donald Wright, um, who had been captured. He was a prisoner of war and he was held for nearly three years um, in Germany um, before the war ended and he was released. This is a fire record. You can see the damage that is from the fire, literally burning the records in Donald Wright's collection. It took me months to get this file because they had to treat it. It had to be preserved as best as they could. Some of the papers were photocopied and I didn't get to see the originals. Some of them were in archival sleeves so that I couldn't touch the original. But when they brought that fire record out to me, there was no doubt that I could still smell the smoke on the pages within this file. Now, because Donald Wright was a POW, Records for POWs are held at College Park, Maryland. So I could request, and I have a lengthy list of POW records to look for. There were three family members who were all captured at different times. That's College Park, Maryland. That's where you're going to go to view World War II POW records. So if you have somebody in the same scenario, I am in their and, you know, record at NPRC. It says that they had been captured as a prisoner of war. Keep in mind, there's extra paperwork in College Park, Maryland. But within that file, it was actually kind of cool were the letters from the Red Cross where all he did was sign his name and they mailed those postcards back to his mother to say, your son's alive. And that was all she got. She didn't know the condition he was in. She didn't know anything more other than, you know, thank God my son is alive. I haven't heard anything in three years. So I, I can't even imagine the angst <laughs> that his wife or his mom, Jeanette, went through until he was released. But all of that was in the file. It was really kind of cool. So if I'm going to request records outside of OMPFs, if I'm going to request burial transfers, or if I'm going to request, this would be good for prisoner of war records at College Park. It would say College Park across the top. I could fill out a form like this. So when I talk about burial transfers, when I talk about military court martial records, this is the form that you would fill out. And you have a copy of this. This is fillable. You can pre-print this. You don't have to write it by hand, but you're going to tell them what you're looking for. So you might have the record group number. You might not, but you're going to fill in additional descriptive information. So you're going to put your name, your contact info, the soldier or sailor, their service number, just like you did on the OMPF form. But then you're going to tell it what you're looking for. I'm looking for, you know, burial transfer files, First World War. And they're going to know what it is that you're looking for. Or I'm looking for court martial records you know, Army, World War II, or Court Martial Records, Navy, First World War. And they're going to know, and, and they can put in, in, in the bottom half under staff use, they can make their notes there for you. So this is what that form looks like. So burial case files, it's almost a misnomer because you think there's going to be a ton of information in here. And unfortunately, there's really not. The vast majority of the records that are in burial case files are dental recognition sheets, you know, so page after page, you'll see how did this body get identified by dog tags or by dental records, because you'll see quite frequently on these forms that the body is too decomposed to, to re recognize, you know, that the remains had to be identified by um, either the dog tag associated with it or their dental records. And why is that? Because basically what these records are, are burial transfers. So soldiers would be buried wherever they had been killed in action. And four months, six months, 16 months later, they might dig them up and move them to a church or a city cemetery until the establishment of um, the American Battle Monuments Commission when they established the American cemeteries overseas. So you might have had a, a soldier who was moved five times before he finally reaches his final resting place, which could be Amiens. It could be um, 
you know, Dover, it could be back in the States. And how are they being identified as they're being dug up and moved is based on those dog tags and those dental records. Next of kin was given the opportunity to either bring their remains home or leave them interred overseas. So you'll see a mix of those in the records. If they chose to repatriate their remains and bring them back to the US, then there would be records detailing that process. What ship are they on? What train are they traveling You know, from the dock? Who's picking up the remains at the dock? And in the First World War, somebody from military service, the branch of service they were in, accompanied the body. So somebody came with them. They didn't just put them on board the train and send them alone. Somebody traveled with them. So within those files, you're going to find things like this. You're not going to find a lot of information about, especially people who were killed in action, if they were wounded, if they had been shot, or if they had been you know, killed by shrapnel or artillery. It's not going to give you the details. It'll give you generalities. They were in this battle. They were killed on this date. You know, but they're not going to tell you they were blown up or, you know, they were shelled. They're not going to tell you that. They will in the World War II records. In the burial case files for the First World War, it's not going to go into that much detail. You'd be shocked. Well, probably not shocked because we just lived through a second um, pandemic. But how many of these records are listed as flu or pneumonia? Just the startling number of them that are listed as having died because of the pandemic in 1918 and 1919. And John Kelly's no exception. So his body was returned home to the family. It tells me, you know, that he had died and that he was in New York. His next of kin is in Dorchester, Massachusetts. This is where the body is being sent. It tells me that it left New York, arrived in Boston. I don't know why it went back and forth. What I'm assuming is the soldier who took the remains brought them to Boston left Boston and returned back to New York. Cause like I said, they would be accompanied. And it tells me who accompanied the body. It tells me that you know, Private Arthur Glass was the one who came, um, who accompanied him back to um back to home. So there's not a lot of detail. There's not a lot of family detail in these records, but you can find some. So John Swackhammer was killed in the Meuse Argonne offensive. He um, did not die of the flu. He actually died from wounds sustained in battle. Gives me his information. And it tells me that the remains of Private John Swackhammer are interred overseas. Um, he was never brought back to his family. He is interred overseas in France. Um, but it lists who the next of kin is. He was never married, so there's no wife. But it tells me his father, his mother, both of his brothers, and what happened to them. Dad's already passed at this point. You know, mom is still living with his two brothers on Willow Avenue in Joliet. And in 1921, when she investigated potentially bringing him back, she winds up passing away. And his remains do not return. And when the, I'm going to talk in just a minute about the, the women's, uh, the mothers and widows pilgrimage, they had sent a letter back to the family and the family alerted them, no, I'm sorry, our mother has passed. She's not eligible to take part in this. And then here's another one for you. This is Everett Cooper. Everett Cooper also um, was killed overseas in France. And then any additional information about his, the disposition of his remains. And again, you're just going to see, you know, identified by dental records and things like that. Here's an example of that. So how do we know that it's Everett? It tells me that the body is in too bad of condition, you know, that, you know, he's identified by, and you can see that right in the middle, that the uniform body, body is decomposed, you know, unrecognizable, but they're identifying him by his dental records. And his body was moved and was interred at the American Cemetery. Um, and he was reinterred for the final time in 1922 at the Meuse Argonne American Cemetery. So these are the types of things that you're going to find in those burial case files. So as I had stated, widows and mo uh, mothers were given the opportunity to travel overseas to Europe. All expenses, the, the military took care of making all of the arrangements for these women to be able to visit the grave sites of 
their sons or their husbands. All of that is included in the burial file. So if you know, family legend says that, you know, great grandma went overseas to see where, you know, uncle John was murdered, you know, or was killed in action. That paperwork will be included in that file. So it'll have a detailed um, itinerary. It'll tell you exactly where they were going every minute of every day, what they're doing. It includes information about the trip, like the things that they expected her to, to prepare before they left. They did little mini dossiers about each woman who went overseas. They wanted to know if she had any health conditions that they needed to be aware of, you know, were they diabetic or had heart issues so that they could be prepared for that. If they spoke other languages, they wanted to know that too, so that it would help them in getting them around in Europe. You could see that they say, here's a copy of, you know, the information detailing the, the potential trip that's going to be coming up. But again, like I said, Eliza Swackhammer had died by that point. She wasn't able to go, and they didn't know that until they sent the letter letting her know that she was eligible. But Mrs. Brown did go. So she did go, you know, Mary Ann Stafford Brown did go um, to visit the grave of her husband, and she had even made a special request to make a side trip to see something else while she was there. And she needed to have permission to do that. So in her file is a letter asking to be able to go and visit with friends who are, you know, in France. They gave her permission for four hours to go and do this. Somebody had to accompany her and then return her back um, so that she could come back with the rest of the women that were on board that particular ship. So there's some interesting things that you can find in these files. I have one file where the woman was a bit of a, of a hypochondriac and there are several letters in the file where you know the the soldier who whose job it was to babysit her you know wrote letters to his commanding officer saying well she's saying she's not feeling good she doesn't want to go today like that's in her file <laughs> repeatedly so you can can find some interesting things in those now individual deceased persons files are in um they're available for world war ii they are not complete just yet. They're still processing these. I had requested records towards the end of the alphabet. I had requested a T and a Y, and they weren't there yet. But they were through the R's and halfway through the S's. So it's something to be aware of if you're trying to request records for somebody with the last name Washington or Yankee. They might not be ready yet. This collection came to the National Archives in St. Louis just before the start of COVID. So it's taken them through no fault of their own, a long time to get this collection processed because it's a pretty, pretty sizable collection. But it's going to include information about the location of the body within the battle or onboard ship. If the ship was sunk, it's going to include information if the body was recoverable or found, the condition that the body was in at the time that it was found. Um, was it returned? to the US or was it interred overseas? Um, if it was like a ship that sank and the body was never recovered, then it would just be kind of a, a general boilerplate form about, you know, that they were, you know, what their position was, where they would have been most likely on board ship at the time that it sank, you know, and that they were listed as um, killed in action, you know, if there were survivors, like they would mention that, you know, there were no survivors or, you know, body was not found. So th it depends on, on how they were killed as part of their military service. All of the correspondence with the family would be in there. So those initial letters letting them know that their son's potentially missing in action or was killed in action, that would be in the file. Letters back and forth to them if the family's writing asking for their insurance that they had on it or their um, pension bonus that they were entitled to, or just requesting their service records, that would be included in the file. If they um, had been promoted or had received a raise while they were in military service, that would be in the file so that they could make sure that that final payment or that pension would be paid at the appropriate rate that they were receiving the money entitled to them under the current rank that they were when they were killed. So there's a lot of information that's in these files. Here's an example of one in, in Plainfield here in Illinois. We had a young man, his name was Earl Rockenbach, who had gone down on the USS Indianapolis. So even if you're not familiar with the USS Indianapolis, if you've ever watched the five-minute monologue in Jaws, 
where he's talking about the boat going in, you know, sinking and, and the, the men on board ship going into the water for three days. I suggest watching it if you haven't watched Jaws in a while. Um, Earl never made it into the water. He was a cook. He was in the belly of the ship at the time that it was sunk. There was no chance for survival for him. So in his file, you know, without being able to give an official, you know, disposition of the body, they basically just listed those details that, you know, unfortunately, he couldn't have survived. His body was not found. It was not recovered. But it gives me the details about his military service. I have his service number. I have the dates that he had gone into the service. I have his place of enlistment his home address, his next of kin. So it lists both his mother and his father listed on that particular form. It's the letter that they sent to the family saying that at this time he's listed as missing in action. Um, eventually they do get a letter that says, you know, we regret to inform you that, you know, your son is declared dead. His remains have not been found, right? All of that is in this particular file. And then letters between him and his parents asking for a copy of his military service file, a copy of the, the bonus, the World War II bonus that soldiers were offered after, after their military service. Um, and this is just part of a four page letter that his father had written, you know, asking, you know, I'm writing to find out, you know, about the, the gratuity, the death benefit for my son. Um, and his is a pretty robust file. What's interesting about his file that you're probably not going to find in any other file is that apparently Earl was engaged to a young lady to be married and they had a joint bank account. And apparently either when he left for service or after he was killed, she emptied the bank account, ran off and got married to somebody else. So there's a letter in his file, in his IDPF saying you know, are we entitled to any money because, you know, this, you know, little harlot in, in so many words, you know, that my son was engaged to ran off and took all of his money. It's fascinating that you would not expect to see in an IDPF, but sure enough, there it was. It was really fascinating. Okay, so let's talk about court martial cases. You know, all court martials are different. Um, some are going to be lengthier than others. It depends on what the charge is. Um, if it's a First World War court martial, the, the funny thing is the index to those lives in College Park, Maryland. There's not a copy of the index in St. Louis. I hope that has changed since the last time I was there because it seemed silly that the index to these records are 500 miles away in Maryland and not at St. Louis where the records were moved, but it's because the record collection had been moved to St. Louis because there was more space for it there. But it's going to include details of the charges. It's going to include include testimony from both the accused and any witnesses. You know, always there's going to be testimony from their commanding officer. There's going to be the general order and special orders that are part that are considered the charge sheet. So it would be a general order that would be written up saying that, you know, so and so, you know, Sam Addison is being brought up on court martial charges for deserting the U.S. Army or whatever it happens to be. Um, and that's that's what it's called. It'd be the record of summary. So what did the jury find? And then the ultimate verdict. Um, so these can be quite lengthy. So I'm only going to show you a couple of these. Um, Sam Addison, he, he was a very simple soul. And unintentionally he had gone a wall twice he had deserted the army twice to go back home so they deposed him they said okay well why do you keep going you know why do you why do you keep deserting why do you keep going home he's like well because i missed my family like it's so heart-wrenching to read this because like you know, he didn't, he didn't mean any harm. He just didn't realize that like, he couldn't just come and go as he pleased, you know, and then you can read the, the cross examination, you know, is he a boy who loves his home a great deal and likes to be at home? Yes, sir. He's very fond of his home. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so simple. Um, it's so sweet, but you'll find these kinds of things in here. So even though he was charged with desertion, you know, which could be prison time, what they eventually found him guilty of was just being AWOL. So the record of summary court, 
you know, says, you know, that he's been, you know, found guilty. But, you know, it tells me here, Private Sam Addison is brought up on charges, you know, desertion in violation of the 14th Article of War. You know, he pleads not guilty. The finding is, you know, we're we're not going to charge him with desertion. We're not going to put him in jail. They're just going to find him guilty of absence without leave. So he's discharged. He's He gets a, 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 a disorderly conduct. He's discharged from the military. He's allowed to go home, but he doesn't have to face jail time, which I think they've realized wouldn't have served the interests of anybody involved. But he didn't just do it once. He did it twice, which is why the second time they were like, just just go. We're we're discharging you. Just please go home. OK, so those are the textual records. I realize I can go on and on and on about textual records, but I don't want to keep you here for six weeks. Um, these following records are records that you can access anytime you want. They're in microfilm cabinets in the reading room. You just have to request your time through Eventbrite, pick your day and go. You don't have to get approval from the National Archives to visit these. So morning reports, I kind of show you a couple of the ones that I was looking at on this particular day. I was looking for the 313th engineers. You can see that they're on this particular reel, you know, and those are the dates that it includes, that they include February of, you know, 1918. That's what I'm going to be looking at. Now, these records have been digitized recently, and a portion of that collection is now available online through Fold3. It is not the entire collection, so if you go out to Fold3 and you're frustrated that you're not seeing the morning reports for the units that you're looking for, they're probably still at the National Archives available on microfilm. They just haven't been processed and made available online yet. So don't think what you see online is the entire collection that the National Archives in St. Louis has. It, it's not complete online just yet. But it's gonna have information about the unit and their strength and their supply. So the morning reports are gonna have things like, you know, how many, how many guns and bullets do they have? How much food do they have? How many uniforms and blankets do they have? So it's gonna tell us about not only troop movements, where did they go today? Where did they go yesterday? How far did they march this particular day? Did they interact with the enemy in any way? But it's going to tell us about supply as well. So, you know, there'll be remarks, you know, talking about transfers and furloughs if somebody's in the hospital or if they're promoted. That's going to kind of be written in the margin. So there's going to be some personal information that might show up in there. Um, but largely, it's just kind of giving you a snapshot of what was going on in the unit, in the company at that particular time. Now, muster rolls and rosters are just like they sound. So the muster roll is going to have everybody who's in the unit, the date that they entered the unit. If they're transferred out of the unit to another division or another company, that's going to be annotated. If they die as part of their military service, that date of death is going to be listed. If, you know, they're on furlough or if they go AWOL, that's going to be written into those muster rolls. And then the monthly reports are, who's here? I, I need a list of everybody who's in the unit. February, March, April, May. And the reason they do a roll call, why they do the, the monthly report is to make sure people are getting paid. Because if in February, you're not listed on that report because they can't find you, you're not getting paid. So the muster rolls, that, that entry, here's everybody who's in here and what happens. The monthly reports are the ones that are gonna tell you where they are, you know, what they're doing. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. You know, they're giving you a little bit of information on that front page about what are what am I looking at? It's like, what does the transcription say? So it's going to let me know what the dots and the dashes and the slashes are. And then it's going to tell me information about all of the officers. So it's always going to tell me every month, it's going to tell me Captain Edward Blair used to be in you know, the 311th engineers until he was transferred to, and it's gonna give me all that information. And it's gonna do that every month. Every muster roll is gonna have that information, but it's only for officers. Once you start getting into the enlisted men, it's just their name and when they enlisted. It's not gonna give me all that extra background information, unfortunately, but I can see, you know, that these guys mustered in and they all mustered in at Camp Grant in May of 1917 you know, at the top or October of 1917. And it's telling me when they're coming into the unit. It's not giving me their service numbers. I'm not gonna find that here, but I will find it in other places. 
So then here's those rosters, those monthly rosters. And look what I have. You know, on the left, I've got dropped as a deserter. He's no longer getting paid. Nobody has any idea where he is, but that's his service number. And I can take that service number to request his OMPF or look for additional information about him. How do I distinguish this Peter Kane from another Peter Kane? By his service number. So I have an ancestor. His name is Angus McDonald. Believe it or not, there's five Angus McDonald's who served in the First World War. Two of them are Angus L. McDonald's, which blows my mind because he was Ang Angus Leroy. How do I know my Angus from that Angus? By his service number. And the beauty in Fold 3 is once I know the service number, I can plug it in and pull up any additional records they have under that service number, even if his name is misspelled. But it gives me the service number. And it tells me, you know, this guy was honorably discharged. You know, we had several men who were transferred to the 120th CAC. And it's giving me information about them. Same thing with the monthly roster, right? It's giving me the names. You know, I've got Samuel McCreaky at the top. I've got Daniel, Donald Heron listed in there. And that Donald Heron's no longer part of the unit, right? And again, I'm getting all of those service numbers. So broken down, sergeants, corporals, privates, giving me all the information by month where they are and what they're doing because they wanted to be paid. But then additional remarks, right? So here's where I was talking about where they want to know, you know, how many guys do you have? How many are healthy? How many are ill? What type of supplies do you need? You know, how many are out sick? How many are on leave? And it's giving me those numbers. They don't always give me specific names. You're going to get a lot of generalities. I've got five guys on furlough right now, this particular week, or I've got eight guys in the hospital. So when you're looking at like pandemic era records, you know, when you're looking in like October and November of 1918 or like April and May of 1919, that those numbers are in, in sick or in the hospital are going to be huge, right? So you have to kind of find out what, did, was my ancestor sick? Were they in the hospital? Did they have the flu or pneumonia? This is where I'm going to find that because it's going to tell me. And then you look at the remarks that they make, you know, from the first day of the month to the 10th day of the month, here's what's going on. You know, that we've got Private Tensley and Hayden who left, right? They're on discharge. You know, on the second, Jesse, you know, Private Jesse was sick, right? And was relieved of duty. You know, on, on the third, you know, Private Merck was listed as AWOL and then furlough. So it's kind, sometimes you'll get the names of the specific people. Sometimes you won't. Sometimes it'll just be, you know, two are on furlough, but they're, they're kind of cool information to find out what was, what was military life like for them? It wasn't always action. Sometimes it was pretty boring. And then those sick reports, like I said, if I want to know who's actually officially in the hospital, there's hospital records on microfilm as well. So I can go to these and see, okay, what am I looking at? At here are the people who are listed as sick, you know, were they, you know, Online duty at the time, yes, they were. What happened to them? These are all the guys in the hospital. A couple of them you could see are listed as being sent to quarters, right? So they were sent back to bed to their barracks. But the vast majority of these guys, again, look at the date. October 15th, October 16th, 1918, right in the smack of the bulk of pandemic flu cases, all these guys are winding up in the hospital. And those are records that are accessible to you in St. Louis. They've got a really robust book collection. So if you're like me and I've never been in the military, so sometimes organizational charts don't make a whole lot of sense to me. There are books that are going to explain it to me from division to unit to company. It's going to show me how these uh, military units um, break down and how they're related to each other. So their research room has a lot of really good collections in it. So if you had somebody stationed at Kelly Field, I didn't know until I looked at this volume that Kelly Field was a place where they had held German Germans as part of their concentration camps. I did not I did not know that until I was reading through these organizational charts. So, you know, kind of tells you who falls under which core and which unit. I had somebody in the CAC, so I wanted to know how was the the 46 CAC tied to everything else, and it broke it down into something I could understand. Okay, so I'm gonna turn my camera back on. Hopefully you have some questions for me.
Hopefully, Katie, I didn't go too long. I apologize. I know that's a lot to digest in a very short period of time, but hopefully now you're all excited to go and start, you know, rolling up your sleeves and looking at these records. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some questions. I think the most questions we've ever had. So just prepare yourself now, Tina. <laughs> okay. Lots of great questions, though. I'm kind of, you know, like, wow, I'd love to know the answer to that. So um, I know if folks need to leave because we have so many questions, we record the Q&A too. So if we don't get to your question and you need to leave, come back and watch the recording because we're, we're answer it. So our first question is I tried to get my father's World War II paperwork about 10 years ago. They were burned. Would it be worth trying again? Absolutely. Even if you requested these records 18 months ago and you got a letter back saying it was a burn record, do it again. Because the extraordinary work that they've been doing, you know, they call it, there's R files and there's B files. So the files that are still too badly gone that they haven't been able to um, image are unavailable, but they're working through and they're re-imaging these records. They're using, you know, all kinds of really cool, I don't want to say 3D technology, but like they're really able to pull text out of documents. It's amazing what they're doing. So one, it's worth it for that because even if they are burned, they might've been able to reconstitute in other ways too. Using those sources, I said, they might've pulled the hospital records, they might have pulled unit records. So there's other collections that they've been using to kind of build those files back up. So if it's been a while, even if it's just been a couple of years, now keep in mind during COVID, I wanna believe that they took the time to make sure everybody got every page out of the file. But when you're 400,000 records behind, you might not have gotten everything. It might yeah. be worth it to request it again. Mm -hmm. Um, so you had mentioned earlier that um, some files might be redacted. So they're wondering, mm -hmm. like, what kinds of things would be redacted in those files? Take out personal information. Um, when I had originally requested my grandfather's records, I requested it as me. And what I got back was six pages. And he was in the Navy. So, I mean, we're not talking a burn file. You know, and it had like his his enlistment papers, it had, you know, his dates of service and his discharge paper, and that was it. I re-requested them and had my grandma sign because she had never remarried after he died, and it was 36 pages. So, you know, there was a lot of stuff left out, like all the ports of call that he had visited, you know, that he had been in the hospital because apparently he had an ulcer. That was included in the file that wasn't in the file that I had requested. So, I mean, they're redacted in some cases pretty heavily just because, you know, their job is to just give you, sorry, I just like stub my toe. Um, their job for redacted files is to just give you what they consider the pertinent information, enlistment and discharge without the, the guts, so to speak, everything else that's in between. So if you have somebody who's next of kin, have them sign the form or go and view it or hire somebody. I mean, there's several researchers. I go at least quarterly. I know I'm due to go back down um, to request the records and photograph them for you. Yeah, so um, can you reiterate, cause I know there were some people confused in the chat about like what I'm a next, I thought I was a next to kin as a grandchild. How can I not request my grandpa's records? And they, yeah. I think they're they're confused about the 62 year wait and um, yeah. what's redacted, what's not redacted. So if you could reiterate that for everyone. Absolutely, next of kin is immediate family. So for me, it would be my siblings, my parents, my children, or my husband next of kin, like an immediate connection to me, you know, not, you know, so that's like that first layer. So like my nieces and nephews aren't a direct relation to me. My grandchildren are not a direct relation to me. My kids are, grandkids would not be right. So like parents would be, so like, you know, a parent could request a file for a soldier, right. But the grandparents couldn't, it's, it's twice removed at that point. So they're only looking at immediate family. So like I said, if a widow remarries and she has a new husband, she's not next of kin anymore. Even if she had children with that particular soldier or sailor, the kids would be, his brothers and sisters would be, not brothers-in-law or things like that, but his sisters or brothers would be, but not nieces, nephews, cousins would not be on the same line. If that 
makes sense. And then, so like I could request it. Anybody can request it. So, you know, Katie, if you wanted to see my grandpa Casey's file, you could request it. You don't have to be related, but you're going to get a redacted file. Um, unredacted is just going to go to those people who are within that first level of being next of kin. But all of that becomes moot once it's past 62 years. The reason why they do that for online records is because it takes time. You know, so if these records would be available online for free to anybody, they would never get anything done. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have to limit online requests to next of kin. But if I go there, I have access to these files because all they're doing is pulling it. I'm doing the legwork. Does it, hopefully that makes sense. So if if it has been less than 62 years, you could just go on site and get an unredacted copy is what you're saying. Only if they're if out of to, service. If they're out of service. Okay. Yes. So if if they did not leave the service until 1973, we're not eligible for those records yet because they're still considered monitored records. So the soldier would need to request it. If the soldier is deceased, then yes, the next of kin would have to ask for it. I would not have access to it. Or like if I was the grandkid, I would not have access. So what they deem modern records, those ones that are still in the, the federal records management facility, have to be next of kin. If it's 62 years or older, anybody has access to it. So if I enlist in the military in 1960 and I get out in 1964, only my next of kin have access to it. Mm -hmm. And they're not in the archives. You have to request them from the other side of the building. That's why that link I gave you at the very beginning kind of explains the nuances of that weird period, like the Vietnam War era, where people are still in the service. They're still modern records. They haven't made their way over to the archives yet. Okay. Hopefully that cleared it up for people. Just <laughs> 62 years is the magic number yeah. you need to remember. Yeah. Um, if it's been more than 62 years, you're great to request anything you want. It, on site. If you're doing it by mail, you still got to be next of kin for the whole file. I don't it's think so because I, I requested my grandpa's and yeah, I got I his, I, I think I got his full file. I guess maybe Ooh, I should make I him like request that. it and see if I got the whole thing. But See if you get anything else. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, do you know if civilians who sewed parachutes during World War II were considered government employees or were they volunteers? I would lean more toward vol volunteers unless you know they were getting a paycheck. So the question would be, what government agency would be responsible for that? So if they're sewing parachutes, like I'm leaning more towards American Red Cross than leaning towards the federal government doing that. Yeah. Um, I'd go through newspapers and see if they make any mention of it because they might say who, who was in charge. Was it the American Red Cross? American Red Cross records are available. There's a, a huge collection of them at Stanford University. Um, they're a not-for-profit. They're not a federal agency. So the records would be kept in a different place. But you know, you would just have to ask yourself, did they receive a paycheck from the federal government for that work? Michael said he had a great suggestion. You almost need a, a decision tree or flow chart for records. How far back? Who can access? How to yes. access? What's redacted? That's so great. You should recommend that, that to is, the government. Yes, <laughs> that is brilliant. Thank you. I, I, I'm writing that suggestion down. Right. That might be helpful, yeah, in future presentations, too, to help um, alleviate some of the confusion, too, definitely. It's just talking about decision trees not too long ago. I'm thinking, thank you. <laughs> or keys, like dichotomous keys, yeah. you know, like for identifying leaves and footprints. I get. <laughs> might work. Um, so our next question, what is the name of Rosie the Riveter's record group? She, well, she was employed by the federal government. She was doing factory work. Um, you could fill out that civilian records request and you just put in what you know. So you might not necessarily have to know the record group. You can kind of discern it if you go to archives.gov and you go into the catalog and you could start playing around with search terms to see what comes up. But if you can put in that, that OMPF request, the civilian side request, what type of work they were doing. And if you know the name of the factory or the, the town, they might be able to figure it out for you. 
All right. Um, next question. Are World War II Civil Air Patrol records in the National Archives? I don't know if they are or not. That's a very good question because Civil Air Patrols were things that were set up by individual communities. So I don't know if there's an overarching federal side to that. But I know like in, in Plainfield, Plainfield Historical Society has records for Civil Air Patrol um because they they weren't it's not an official military branch kind of like how coast guard wasn't at the time merchant marines weren't they were just um they weren't even volunteers but um so i would probably start on the state level i'd probably look at the state archives to see what they have on civil air patrol um and then if this the state might tell you reach out to the county or reach out to the municipality, but I don't know if those ever reached all the way up to the federal level or if those stayed within the states. Kind of like Red Cross branches stayed within the states, mm -hmm. and whether or not the state kept their records or gave them, you know, donated them back to Red Cross, um, like the Red Cross offices are in Washington D.C. right by the White House. Um, I. Yeah don't have yeah. I, I cannot speak with authority other than the civil air patrol and civil air defense records that we have are local yeah so i would guess you might need to follow up for sure and ask an archivist at the national archives if you aren't able to find it more locally uh, let's see do you know if civilian records exist for the cadet nursing corps for nurses being trained but never actually enlisted because the war ended Oh, good question. I yeah. know that there's a lot of records for nurses um, in the First and Second World War that are in the National Archives. Um, there's a couple layers to that. I can't speak about World War II because I haven't looked at them personally. I've only looked at them for First World War records. Um, but it took 60 years before nurses got the recognition that they deserved for the First World War service. Um, most of them fall under Army, but there were some that showed up in Navy records. The fun thing about nursing records, check on the county level. When soldiers were discharged and they came back after the war and they filed a copy of their discharge papers, it'd be one page. And it would have, you know, height, weight, hair color, where were they born, where did they serve, what date were they discharged, where are they living now? nurses were like four and five pages long because it said every place where they were nursing during their service. They're really robust and those are on the county level. So that gives you a really good starting point because if they're listed in the county level, there might be a service number or a unit associated with it. Then you could take that unit information and look in archives one or two to see if there's any information about them as part of that unit. And then you can request their OMPF file as part of, you know, any type of military service, whether it's, you know, sailors, soldiers, nurses are included in that too. So there's, there's a couple of different levels when it comes to nurses. Same kind of thing too with like boys who were in college that had joined, um, oh my goodness, what is the name of it? Um, it had a name before ROTC, and I apologize, I'm drawing a blank on what the acronym was, um, that, you know, they had joined to be officers, and then the war ended before they ever went to basic training. Those records stayed at the universities. Um, they didn't make it because they weren't actually in the Army yet. They'd never mm -hmm. made it to basic training yet. So you could find those referenced in a lot of um, university and college archives. All right. Um, next question. Uh, second great grandfather was discharged in 1946. Will they know when he died and where? Not necessarily, unless the family was asking for military burial. That's something you're probably going to go through the VA for versus the National Archives. So I would probably start with the VA office in your state, wherever he's buried. Um, there are what are called XC files, and you'll see those in National Archives records, um, usually Civil War and anybody that predates modern first world war second world war and XC files are usually those that had requested merit had, they had lived long enough that they they start running into modern records after 1914 um that are asking for things like military headstones that are looking for things like um military salutes 
at their graveside. Um, but a record collection I would probably start with to figure out exactly when they died would be something like um, the headstone files that are in, in Family Search and the Burroughs records that are in Ancestry. So if you know somebody served, you know they're deceased already, but you don't know when they died, um, the, the service headstone online, I think, go up into the 19... They've opened in the 1970s now. They used to stop at 1956. And now they go considerably further. And Burl's files go up to 2004. So um, Burl's files aren't terribly helpful. Um, they just have the soldier's name, date of birth, date of death, and service number. So if you have one of those pieces of information, like I was looking for William Craig. Yeah, good luck. But I had a date of birth. I had a specific date of birth. So I was able to go through them until I found my guy, hoped it was my guy, then took that service number, looked it up in Fold3, requested the file to find out, yeah, this this was my guy, not somebody with the exact same birth date in the same name, which happens. Like, I'm a baseball fan, right? So I'm a Dodgers fan. And there's Max Muncie. And not a common name, but there's another Max Muncie that the Dodgers drafted, who's like 10 years younger than the other Max Muncie. And the wild thing about it is they share the same birthday. Wow. So, I mean, it happens. Like, it absolutely happens. So, I mean, yes, you could find somebody that has the same name and the same birthday. Um, but you're going to need one of those two pieces of information in the Burroughs files. But the headstone applications are pretty good because they give you date of birth, date of death, their service, where they're actually interred, who signs off on the headstone application, which is usually the cemetery sex den. Um, so there's some decent information in there. Right. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. Um, so would civilian records be available um, with that 62 year um, limit for uh, employees of the CIA? Ooh, I don't know if those yeah. would actually make it to the National Archives because the CIA and the FBI have their own archives. Um, so my guess would be that, that those might be requests that you would have to file directly through um, the CIA. I haven't even thought to try to request those from the National Archives, but I do know that they have um, they have their own archives. All right. Nice to know. I didn't know that either. Um, next question. My uncle served in the Navy in World War II. He was stationed in Darwin, Australia, and was a personal driver for two admirals. Would there be employment records as a driver aside from his military file? It'd be in his military file. Because if he was still, you know, uh, whatever his role was in the Navy, whether it's an ensign or a lieutenant or a private, that would be included in that file. It, it would only be separate if, you know, his service time was up and he had left military service and had stayed on and was hired as a driver. Um, but, yeah, it should be within his file. Okay. Um, so there's a couple questions about the Army Air Force records. You had mentioned the 1947 date. Mm -hmm. Um to 1964 being partially destroyed. So someone's wondering um, if you request records from before that 1947 period when officially the Air Force was, mm -hmm. um, how did they request those? Are, are those okay? Were those in the fire? They're in the fire too, because I had some that were like in the balloon squad during the First World War and those records were destroyed. So the it'd be Army Air Corps. So you would put US Army Air Corps when you would request them because Air Force is what starts after 1947. So it doesn't split into its own. It's still part of the army at that particular time, but all of those records were impacted. So I had a couple of guys, um, one was a pilot down at Kelly Field during the first world war. There's no record. So those were just as impacted. Right. Um, what about exemptions for military service? So someone's wondering, would you find copies of those exemptions, like a farm exemption or a family exemption? You would probably find them on the local level under the draft board. So there are draft board records collections that are available at the National Archives. Um, I, I can't tell you on a state by state basis, but if you don't see them in the National Archives catalog, I would probably go to the state archives and look for draft board. Like records, I would search specifically. And if you know the draft board, because they're usually listed in the newspaper. So you can kind of get a feel for which draft board it might have been, or even on their draft card. So now that the World War II draft cards have been digitized and they're available through Ancestry and Family Search, it'll have the draft board on the backside. Or for the First World War, it'll list the draft board. Usually for World War I, there's usually not more than two draft boards. World War II, you'll get 
many more draft boards, but it should be on there and those are available. Um, I would I would definitely look for the draft board information locally. And if I can't find it, then I would look for it um, at the National Archives. So for discharges because of immigrant status, so speaking of exemptions, so the National Archives does have in their records collections, um, people who are drafted, right? Because when you were drafted, you didn't have to be a US citizen. Once you were drafted during basic training, during basic training, they would ask you, would you like to become a US citizen? We can fast track your request. If you said no, then there would be a deposition and they would ask you, well, why don't you want to be a US citizen? And they would ask you all kinds of questions. Um, so some would be like, well, because my brother's in the German army, I don't, I, you know, I don't want to fight against him, or I, you know, I, I might want to go home to Greece when the war is over. Like I don't want to be a US citizen or I want to return to Mexico. Typically, those people would be discharged. They not dishonorably discharged, they would just be discharged, right? They would be given the exemption. And there would be an annotation in their file that, you know, they didn't want to become a U.S. citizen and they were discharged from the Army. Those are arranged in Washington, D.C. in Archives 1 by unit, like by um, by camp and then numerically by unit. So if they were at Camp Grant and they were in the 112th machine gunners, then in the files in the Adjutant General's records, which I think is record group 393, I'd ask for the records for Camp Grant and I would ask for um, the, because they're numerical. So I would ask for the box that has the 112th machine gunners. And then within there would be all of those people that were um, asked if they wanted to become citizens. There'd be a separate file for those who said yes. And for those who said no, there would be those depositions. They're fascinating. Some of those are digitized and some of those are available through Fold3, but by no means is that an entire collection. Um, what about uh, if someone worked for the draft board? There's a question in the chat about um, their mother working for the draft board. Um, so th are those records in civilian files or are they in the selective service records? I don't know, but that would definitely be something to investigate. So if you find them on the local level at the state level, then you know they probably weren't hired by the federal government, that they were probably either receiving a state paycheck or a county paycheck. So I would just be looking to see, are these records for the draft board showing up on the state level? If not, if you find them in the federal records collections, then yes, they're employed by the federal government and potentially there could be a copy of that um, civilian employment record available at St. Louis. I don't know enough about them. I do know that Selective Service has its own paperwork that you can write to the Selective Service and get copies of, of um, draft cards. So like if you had somebody who um, was born before 1960, there's a form that you fill out for selective service and they'll mail you a copy of their application. Cool. Um, so potentially they could have those records as well, but I don't, I can't say with any authority whether those are state records or federal records. Yeah. So start with the state archives um, where that person would work. Um, someone's wondering about a Civil War person. So they have the Civil War pension file for their great-great-grandfather. Is that all that would exist? Or are there other records available in other collections or other repositories? Oh, yeah, there'd be other collections. There'd be other Civil War collections. So there'd be the Civil War pension file, but then there'd also be his Civil War service record too, which is separate. It's not as robust. It's maybe six, eight pages. It, there's not a whole lot to it. But basically, it includes those monthly vouchers. Was he there? You know, did he get paid? That's kind of what's in the service file. But then there's going to be unit files, right? There's going to be regiment files, just like what we would see for the, the First or Second World War. Um, if he had been in the hospital, there would be hospital records that would be associated with that. Like if he was a doctor during the Civil War or a nurse during the Civil War, there's different records collections for that. Um you would have adjutant general's records on the state level as well for the civil war. So you'd have the federal record, but then there would also be state adjutant general's records as well, which aren't always the same because people would write to the state for a copy of their discharge papers if they lost them or if they were destroyed in a house fire or something. So you'll find a lot of letters of service in the state records that you're not gonna find in the federal records because you know, they were in state units. So they would write to the state adjutant general and say, I served from this date to this date. I've lost my papers. Can you 
verify. I want to collect my pension now. So there's lots of Civil War paperwork that exists out there, but don't just look on the federal level at, at the National Archives. Contact the state also and see if you can get copies of the files in the Adjutant General's file on the state also. Follow-up question about Civil War. Um, would wagon masters who were hired by the government in the Civil War for the Union have records? Potentially. There were a lot of camp followers. You know, there were washerwomen, there were cooks, there were a lot of people that traveled with the unit. Um, it's worth it to take a look and see. I'd probably start with the state adjutant general's records first before I looked for federal records. Um, and you're going to look at the admin files. So the way that states break down their records, they're by unit and then by company. So if I'm looking for Illinois 4th Cavalry, and there was the 4th Cavalry Company A, B, C, D, E, I'd ask for records on the 4th Cavalry. If I knew he was in C, I'd ask for the C file, which would include the muster rolls. It would include, you know, all of that month, those monthly reports, after action reports would all be in there. But in the admin file, that's where those letters of service are. That's where those letters of promotion or discharge from military service, like all of that admin of running the unit is in the admin file and it's separate from the individual company records. So I would ask to see the admin files for that um, and see if there's any mention of those as well. But then if they didn't travel with the unit and they were just stationed at a particular camp or base, then I would be looking for the records about the base itself. Um, so like, for example, I, I mentioned Great Lakes Naval Base earlier. That's where everybody does their training now. Before it used to be the Midwest and the, the East went to Great Lakes. Everybody on the West Coast went to San Francisco for their training during the Second World War. Now Great Lakes houses everybody. But um, the, the unit records are in College Park or DC. The personnel records are in St. Louis, but the records about the camp, right? The the records at the guardhouse, who's coming and going, the air and water temps, right? Like all of that day-to-day -day stuff is at the National Archives in Chicago. Um, so it's just a matter of figuring out, did they travel with the unit or did they stay at the base and shuttle people back and forth? Because that's gonna kind of tell you how you're gonna come down and look for those records. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Another question about the Civil War. Um, what about those killed in action during the Civil War? Um, are there special records for that? Because they know what battle that, that person was killed in, but they don't know where that person's buried. I don't know for certain. I know that they're referenced in the muster rolls and the after action reports in the individual units. I cannot say with any certainty whether or not there are separate records collections specifically for those killed in action. I apologize. I haven't had to do it. I do know that there are separate records associated with prison camps. So if somebody was at, you know, Libby or if they were at Andersonville, there's separate records collections for that. But I don't know about killed in action. I apologize. All right. That's okay. Um, another Civil War question. What is the GAR and where would those records be found? On the state level. The GAR is the Grand, Rec uh, Grand Army of the Republic, and it was founded by what would eventually become the governor of Illinois. So go us. Governor Logan is the one who created the Grand Army of the Republic. It was original, originally founded a year after the war ended for soldiers to kind of honor, you know, their brethren, those who um, were killed in action, um, those who had been wounded. Um, GAR posts, just like American Legion posts or VFW posts, um, were set up individually. So records can be at the city, they can be at the county, they could be at the state. So depending on where you are, like if you're in New York, New York State Archives has a fantastic GAR collection. You're lucky if they're in New York because it's fantastic. If you're in Illinois, it's rough because those records are at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. And they're very spotty because they're not official military documents because they're not federal government records. The state is responsible for deciding whether or not they want to keep them or not. And individual GAR posts. So they lasted about a decade. And then a lot of them closed just because guys lost interest. So, you know, 18, the late 1870s, a bunch of posts closed. And then there was like this resurgence in the 1880s where guys are getting older in age, right? They want to start applying for pensions. They're starting to think about their war service. And a lot of posts reestablish. 
but when they reestablish, they're given different numbers. So in Plainfield, we had a post, right? It was like post 14 or something like that. Post closed. When they re-upped about 12 years later, then it became post like 119. You know, so the number could change. So you want to look through things like city directories, you know, find out did the post number change at some point? Did the post merge? So eventually all the Civil War guys in Plainfield were too old and they died off. The two remaining guys that were still alive joined the Aurora GAR post in a county, two counties over from us, because that was the only one that still had any guys that were still alive, right? What the GAR would include in it would be, you know, the guys who are paying their dues. They would elect officers every year. There would be a, an annual membership drive where, you know, these guys would apply. Um, so that's what you would find in any GAR post records that might have survived and were turned over to the to the state. All right. So it would just be those annual rosters of guys who are paying their dues. If you stopped paying your dues, you're not in the records anymore. So. In the 1930s, when the GAR put out a bunch of books with burial locations to GAR members, the only guys who were included in those books were the guys that were still dues paying members when they died. So if you, you know, stopped paying two years before you died, you didn't go into the book. So it's, it's very hit or miss. Like it's GAR records can be hard to find. Um, there's a website that I use all the time that's called Archive Grid, A R C H I V. G R I D. Um, mm -hmm. It's the place where I go for how do I find what I don't know, right? So if I'm looking for records on on vaudeville, right? I don't know where to look for vaudeville records. Where am I going to go? Archive Grid is a, a collection of. It's a website that has information about archives, manuscripts, collections, museums, things like that that have loose archives, not printed volumes, but loose archives. That could be family histories, that could be map collections, that can be, you know, gov docs collections where they're loose papers. You could go in there and do a search, you know, for the name of the GAR post, right? So you could put in New York GAR post 423. And if any records exist anywhere, it might just be a photograph. It might be a roster. It might be, you know, who knows? It's going to tell you where it is. And then you'll be able to reach out to that institution and ask for a copy of that particular document. And that might not be bad for any of these questions, Civil War questions, you know, Rosie the Riveter questions, right? Who's got information on her? I can go into Archive Grid and see who has stuff. And it's going to tell me what it is, right? It's going to tell me if it's personal papers. It's going to tell me if it's, you know, employment records. It's going to tell me if it's photographs or maybe an oral history sound recording. It's going to tell me what it is. I'm not going to see the original but it's going to tell me what it is and where to find it. Yeah. Can I post a link to archive grid in the chat? And a couple of Thank people you. asked about um, the chat. I will send out the chat along with the recording. So <laughs> if you don't uh, grab these links that we've thrown in there or all the great comments, um, you'll see them in the chat after the fact. Um, hopefully our last civil war question. Oh my um, goodness. This one is my great great grandfather served as a medical aide, possibly a nurse, at the Satterfield Hospital in Philadelphia during mm -hmm. the Civil War and um, lived in Philadelphia during that time. What collections could this person research to find documentation of his service? Oh, there's so many places in Philadelphia. I mean, their collections are absolutely amazing. So whether it's the Philadelphia Historical Society, whether it's the Philadelphia Athenaeum, the Free Public Library in Philadelphia. There's a National Archives facility in Philadelphia that would have the regional records. Um, there's there's just lots of pieces to that puzzle. So think about what you want to focus on. So if you want to focus on Saturday Prison, like for example, go into Archive Grid. Who has information on Saturday Prison? Who has information on you know that you know particular um, unit or hospital, right? Medical unit, right? And I, I'm going to be trying to find all the pieces because nothing lives in just one spot. Even if I were just researching a civil war unit, right? There's going to be federal records. There's going to be state records. There's going to be things in people's personal collections where maybe somebody wrote a memoir or a series of letters or kept a diary that's going to reference this particular prison. Maybe there are or hospitals, you know, there might've been people in their Civil War pensions that, you know, reference being a patient in the hospital at any given time. So like there's lots of moving parts 
to anybody's life. But when you're talking about military um, service in particular, there's a bunch of pieces to that. So, you know, like I said, someplace like Archive, Archive Grid, even the Pennsylvania State Archives, the Pennsylvania State Library, the Pennsylvania, like I said, the Pennsylvania Historical Society are each probably going to have a different piece of this. Somebody might have sketches of it. Some people might have photos from it. Some people might have nurse registers. Like there's going to be little bits and pieces everywhere. Now, people have this tendency to think that the National Archives houses everything, and they don't. And the reason why they don't is because you have to keep in mind, excuse me, the U.S. Archives doesn't start until 1936. So they're at the mercy of what gets turned over to them. I'd written, I, I'd written the archives once, and I know this is a snarky thing to say because I know you're recording, but I had written to the archives once, and I was asking for information about Mitchell Airfield because Mitchell Military Base is where a lot of pilots were trained, both for the First and Second World War. And I was looking for information on pilots specifically. And I wrote a letter to the archives, and I had asked, you know, where can I find this information? And I got the snarkiest answer back from Archives 1, not Archives 2. Archives 2, they're wonderful. I love them. Um, saying, well, you realize the archives wasn't started until 1936. You know, we're not going to have those records. And I said, you have Revolutionary War records. <laughs> right? How can you tell me you don't have World War One records, which was, you know, 15 years, but yet you've got 200-year-old records. Like, it was like, <laughs> don't feed me a line. You're going to get people who aren't going to want to help. And if you are not in the military, you're going to get a lot of people who give you a hard time because you don't have the right terminology. And they're just going to be rude. And whether they intend to be rude or not, I don't know. But there were plenty of times when archive staff made me cry because they belittled me because I was a woman. It wasn't until I got to archives, too, that like I could have hugged them because they were so kind. Let's sit down and we'll work on it together. Everybody else was like, well, if you don't have the right terminology, I can't help you. Well, I'm coming to you because you know it. Yeah. You're the one that's supposed to help me. Um, so my experiences with the National Archives weren't always great. NPRC is wonderful. I, I mean, Heidi and, and Tim and Eric, who are in the research room, are fantastic. Um, but you're always going to get those people who, you know, either don't want to be bothered or think that, well, you should know this. But there's lots of levels to that. So don't give up. It's going to be frustrating. You might want to be tempted to draw a circle on your wall so you can aim better when you bang your head against it. Um, but eventually you're going to start to put that puzzle together and and develop a picture that makes sense to you. All right. Um, next question. Uh, is the serviceman's blood type listed on those Navy records that you might be able to request? You know what? I don't recall seeing it. I can't say necessarily if it's there or not. But off the top of my head, it's not something I've ever focused on. It's not anything that's ever drawn my attention to it. So I can't, I can't say. All right. Um, if records are part of what was destroyed in the fire and you don't know their unit or what dates, is there somewhere else that you can look for information to recreate those records? Absolutely. I'm going to look on the state level. I'm going to reach out to the county and see if there's a discharge paper or a VA entry for them, right? That's all done on the state level. I'm going to go through newspapers and see if they're listed as having been drafted. I'm going to look at things like county histories because um, even in the First World War, there, were, there was like a resurgence in county histories that were published in the 1920s that would reference First World War and Spanish American War service, just like those county histories in the 1870s and 80s were referencing Civil War. Um, histories. I'm going to, I'm going to look there. I'm going to reach out um, to the local historical society and the, the county museum or the county archives and ask them, you know, do you have a roster of soldiers from this county that serve? So there are bits and pieces where you can start to find out um, whether or not they served. Sometimes even in the cemetery, they're going to, they're going to mark veterans graves, right? So there's going to be an annotation in the cemetery log, whether or not that person was a veteran. Don't overlook veterans groups, right? Whether that's the American Legion, whether that's the VFW, whether that's the GAR. In order to join one of these groups, when you apply, you had to list your military service. So, you know, I can get a copy of my grandpa's VFW application and it's going to have his, 
if not his serial number, at least it's going to have his unit and his dates of service. So even reaching out to those local groups, even if there's an American Legion and a, VA, a VFW in that community, contact them both. Because at different points in their life, they might have been members of one over the other. All right. Um, someone's asking, they have a research card from the National Archives in D.C. Should they also get a National Archives card for the regional branches, or do they have to get a National Archives card for the regional branches? I would say yes, because when I was in St. Louis, they said that they're not networked yet. So yet. Hopefully that's going to be coming. But I still had to have an individual card to research in St. Louis and to research in Seattle. So it, they probably will tell you to fill it out and watch the video. Um, to my knowledge, and this is, when was I there last? We're in October now. The last time I was there was July. They weren't networked yet. All right. Um, if someone was arrested and in German custody as a POW, but released or escaped, where would those records likely be found? POW records for U.S. soldiers and sailors are at College Park. They're in, at the National Archives, too. All right. Um, someone says, my uncle died on a board a ship in Pearl Harbor. Where would we find his burial record information? It should be part of, like, those headstone applications in the, the I just drew a blank on the name of it, American Battle Monuments Commission, ABMC. Um, they should have records of those, plus um, any records associated with Pearl Harbor. Again, that's a base. So those records would either be, I don't remember if those are in San Francisco or Honolulu. Um, they potentially would have uh, records there. Um, in their service record, there would be an annotation that they were lost, you know, when the ship sank. And then at St. Louis, also, you would request the individual deceased person's file. Um, so just like um, Earl that went down on the Indianapolis, it might not be specific. It just might be, you know, this is where they would have been on board ship. Their remains were not recovered. Um, they're being declared, you know, deceased. You know, so it, it might, it'll have a lot of information in it of the aftermath, like talking to the family and records back and forth. Um, but as to the cause of death and everything, it might just give you that generality if the body wasn't recovered. And then um, just quickly as a follow-up, can you recap how and where we get those IDPF files? From St. Louis. So you're going to fill out that second form that I showed you, not the OMPF file, um, but you're going to fill out... Um, that second form, and you're going to put everything you know, you know, so you're going to put their name, their birth date, where they were born, who their parents are. And then in that additional fields notes, you're going to put individual deceased persons file, you know, and then list, you know, were killed on board, the name of the ship, you know, sank at the Battle of Pearl Harbor, and the date, and they will know how to get in and look for that collection. Okay. Um, someone says, um, if my dad entered service before the 62 year mark, but was discharged after 1962, can I get partial records at this point? Are they still alive or are they deceased? They did not say. So. If they are still alive, I would ask them to request it because they're going to get a complete unredacted file. If they are deceased, you might be eligible to request it, but you're not going to do it through that email address I gave you because those are going to be still within the records management portion of the National Archives, not the National Records Personnel Center. So you're going to go to the St. Louis Archives webpage through archives.gov, but it's going to be a different address you're contacting for those records. And I don't know, even if they're deceased, if they'll give you the entire file, it might be redacted. Yeah, she did confirm he is deceased, so. All right, um, let's see. Can I request records for mother or father that worked on bases? Um, both of them are deceased. Mm -hmm. As next Absolutely. of kin, yeah. yeah. You're, you're gonna fill out the exact same forms. Again, it might be the kind of thing that you wanna go look at in person if you have the ability to go to St. Louis and do it. Um, but yeah, you can easily request those. But then I'm also going to find out which regional archives would be responsible for those, um, for that base and see if there's any additional information. So outside of just their personnel file, their employment record, when they were hired, if they were promoted, how much they were paid, there might be more information in the base records, you know, like 
I don't know if they had joined the bowling league because bases had baseball teams and bowling leagues and, and boxing clubs. And like, if they had participated in any of that, it'd be in the regional archives versus in their employment file. All right. And then someone said um, their brother was in the Marine Corps uh, in 1973, uh, leaving in 1975. He died 1999. When can I access his record? Well, as a sibling, that would be next of kin, correct? I would give it a try. I would yeah. see what they say. They're probably going to have you supply a copy of the death certificate and then supply something that shows that you're related. So maybe your birth certificate, their birth certificate that shows the same parents. Like they might make you jump through more hoops because it's a much more modern record. Because if he's deceased in 1999, there might be more, more answers you need to supply than somebody who passes in 1978. Um, what happens if all the next of kin are deceased? Then you could request the file, but you're probably not going to get the entire file. Okay. Um, are daughters-in-law considered next of kin if they have not remarried? I don't believe so. It would have to be the son that would have to sign the request. Because just like with cousins and just like with grandchildren, they're not officially next of kin because they're not blood related. Um, and someone said, if you do make that decision, Tree, she wants you to share it with all of us. <laughs> got it. I did make my note. I didn't make yeah. that decision. <laughs> we still got quite a few questions, so hopefully you're still able to answer. Um, I'm okay if you guys are okay. We have until five o'clock when the library closes, <laughs> so we <laughs> hopefully we'll get through. I'll give you five minutes at least to wrap <laughs> up and get out the door. Um, where are records for women in World War II? It depends on what we're looking for. If we're looking for the wax or if we're looking for the waves or if we're looking for whichever branch of service, it would depend on what branch of service they were participating in. So like if they were in the waves, right, they're, they're going to be part of Navy records. So you're going to look for base information. You're going to apply for a copy of their service file. Um, a lot of waves in wax were trained through particular universities. Um, so like um, I had one wave in my family, Irene, who was at um, a university in New York City. The university even had some information. They had photos and some other stuff of them being trained. So um, just like you would look for service men, right? You're gonna look for service women. So whether they were telephone girls, you know, whether they were, you know, wax, whether they were, you know, working, you know, in the nursing corps, it, it's gonna be based on the the military branch that they're that they're researching. But keep in mind, too, that each military branch has its own historian. The Navy has a historian. The Army has a historian, right? So if you have questions about specific units, you can reach out, to, excuse me, to the National Archives and, um, oh, not Archives Hub. Why am I drawing a blank on, on um, the name of the service? History Hub is the name of the service. So you can say, I had somebody who was in this, right? And somebody from the archives is gonna answer that question. Um, but you could also reach out to the Navy historian or reach out to the Army historian and ask them the same questions. And there are different things that live, like I said, in different places, you know? So like Great Lakes Naval Base has an archivist. If I have specific questions about Great Lakes, I can reach out to him and ask. So, you know, there are lots of people who are gonna have parts of answers. All right. Um, what about, uh, will military records reveal the name of the Liberty ship that returned a serviceman to the U.S. from England and the date of his return? It would have the date of the return. It should list the ship, but I don't want to say with 100% certainty that it does. Um, because, again, it depends on whether or not it's a full file or it was damaged. You know, if it's if it's a, it turns out to be a burn file, it might not have that information on it. But that's when I'm going to turn to public history. So that's when I'm going to look for things like newspaper accounts that are talking about the ship landing. I'm going to look for community news where they're going to be like, our boys are home. And this one, you know, returned on this date and might list the name of the ship. Another thing I didn't mention, might as well mention it now, right? Our um, unit um, war diaries. So think of Radar O'Reilly, right? Think of MASH, right? Radar's the company clerk and Radar's job is to write down and keep track of all of the supplies, right? What's happening? You know, what supplies do we need? You know, how many, um, how many trucks do we have? How many Jeeps do we have? What type of supplies do we have? 
every unit had um, a war diary, which will tell you day by day, minute by, by minute, exactly what's going on in that particular unit throughout the course of the war. And there are a couple of different places that have fairly large collections of war diaries. And I'm not talking like individual, you know, you know, dear Suzanne type diary. We're talking about official military diaries. Um, First World War and Second World War museums in, in Kansas City and in New Orleans have fantastic collections. You're going to find some of them on Fold 3 that have been digitized. And then the um, U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, has an enormous collection of Army war diaries as well for the first and second world war so you know just if you know the unit like if we know that it's the 313th engineers i can do a google search for you know 313th engineers war diaries and see if it brings up who might particularly have these but the war diaries are going to tell you exactly what ship they're on because the clerk would have been keeping track of all that information and exactly what time it docked, how long it took them to empty the ship and get everybody onto shore. Like it's going to have all of that information in it. All right. Um, someone's wondering, can you request monthly rosters or hospital sick reports for a specific unit or a specific date of World War One? You can. Um, if you request them through the National Archives, they might do it for you. It depends on how busy they are, or they might tell you to contact a researcher and have the researcher do it. But they do have them, and you know they should be able to tell you whether they have that particular date or that particular unit. It's been hit or miss. I have asked before um, for specific things. Um, Sometimes they'll do it for me and send me the copy because I'm looking for this date, right? I'm not looking for six months worth. I'm looking for a specific thing. And sometimes they'll tell you, you know, here's a, a page that lists all of our researchers. You can reach out to them. It just depends. But yes, they they you could submit a request and ask for something that specific and see if they'll if the staff will do it without referring you to somebody else. Okay. Um, there's uh, this person says my grandfather received an exemption from World War One draft. Would he automatically be exempted from the World War Two draft? He might have been exempted just because of his age. So I would go in and take a look in Family Search or Ancestry and see um, if he's listed in the draft cards. Now they've had the, what they called the old man's draft, which were those who were over the age of 40, 44. Um, who still had to fill out draft cards, but were ineligible. They weren't going to draft them. Um, those were digitized years ago, but they've been adding the three subsequent drafts for World War II as well. So I would just take a look on that card and see how he's listed, if he's listed as 1A or 4F. And my guess would be if he was ineligible during the first World War, he would be ineligible in the second. But I can't say with certainty. You'd have to look at the card. All right. Um, would field hospital records exist and possibly list a physician treating a wounded soldier during World War II? Yes, but they're not easy to find. So there are plenty of maps that College Park, Maryland has at Archives 2 that list where all of the triage hospitals, field hospitals, um, general hospitals are during the war. So if you have a general idea of where they are, it's going to list where that is. Each one has different types of records. And here's where it gets frustrating. Like I had somebody who was a nurse in hospital 12 and I had somebody who was a patient in hospital two, right? They had the nurse's records for hospital two and the patient records for hospital 12. It was like, no, I need those in reverse. Um, so they might have them. Um, it's just a matter of, of rooting them out. I apologize. I can't remember the name of the record group, but I know a lot of those hospital records, if it's overseas, should be at College Park. They might defer you to Kansas City because that's where the stateside hospital records are. Um, but there's going to be some kind of record. But they kept two sets. They kept like the doctors and the nurses, and then they kept the patients. And I can't guarantee they're going to have the right one that you need for that particular hospital. Um, but they they do have field hospital and triage and general hospital records. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and someone's confirming you did say that postmaster records are in civilian records at the. NDRC. They do have some. Yes. Right. Now, a lot of records are sampled, so I can't guarantee that they're going to have your particular person, but they do have postmaster records. There's a lot of postmaster records already available through Ancestry. Um, so you can find post you can find 
I want to say 1860s, 70s, and maybe up to 1880s, already in Ancestry. Um, and if you look at those, even if you're looking after that, go into Ancestry, look at that collection, go down to the bottom to info and see what they say the record collection group number is, because that's going to help you when you go to request it, if you're going to request it from St. Louis. All right. Let's see. Um... My husband, my aunt's husband was killed in Belgium in World War II. I was able to find some high level info on him, but would there be more details related to the actual battle or his injuries? The IDPF would list injuries. So it would tell you whether or not he had died, you know, that day, you know, from shrapnel or whether he died after the fact. It would have that information. I should have that information in it, right? If he was, you know, temporarily buried before he was either brought home or um, repatriated into one of the American cemeteries, that would be included in it. It would include the correspondence back and forth between family, letting them know. Um, trying to think of where else. Um, I think, I mean, you can ask for the service level record, but I th think asking for the IDPF is gonna have exactly what you just said, what you just mentioned that you were looking for. Okay. Um, so someone said that they served in Vietnam War um, and requested you, their sure. files. Um, they were surprised when they received four, 747 pages of paperwork covering oh, their active wow. and reserve service over 12 years. Um, but besides the usual required service documentation, um, it included the ship's log, related operations paper, um, as extensive as all this was, though, it didn't include any service-related confidential and secret service clearances. Um, so they're wondering, um, where's all this security clearances paperwork, or can they even access this information? I have suggestions, but I don't know whether or not it's, it's going to be the right answer, because I, I haven't pursued it. But it's a conversation I've had with somebody else who we came to find out after he died, he was a spy during the Vietnam War and that he was in Vietnam as a teacher of English. Um, and what we were told was to either look at the Department of Defense to look for their um, files for citizens overseas um, to see if any of that is listed in there. Um, I don't know if anything would be listed in the Department of State, but it wouldn't hurt to check. So in diplomacy files through the Department of State, you know, for those people who um, are overseas and who are, you know, assigned to or have to work through an embassy, they would have those records. So potentially the Department of State, if if you ever had to go through the embassy for clearance for any reason, I might look there or look through Department of Defense to see if they'll, and I know that's not a great answer, but at least it's a shot in the dark and hopefully they would have them. I'd love yeah. to ask my husband, cause he has security clearance too. And he worked for the Department of Defense at the Pentagon. So I would assume since he did security work for ballistic missile defense, that his records would probably be at the DOD would be my guess. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, someone said, my husband served in the military 1978 to 1982, but when we requested his records for employment purposes, we were told they burned. But this was after the time of the fire. So why would they say that they burned? <laughs> well, I mean, you have to think about how records collections were kept. They could have been adjacent in some way, right? They could have been on a upper floor that caught fire, you know, because the flames are rising. I, I I couldn't say with any certainty or unless somebody just kind of blanket copped out and was like, oh, those are these records? Oh, they're all burned. We've all experienced that, right? People tell us that all the time. Oh, we had a courthouse fire. No, we don't have any records. Yeah, you do. Um, so I, I can't speak to why they would turn it down. But again, I would try again. Could have just been that staffer. It was you know, it was 425 and they were like, I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. I just want to get this request off my desk. <laughs> I mean, I overheard once I was in the elevator at the national archives. I was going up to the second floor and I almost always have a pencil, right? Stuffed in my hair. And I'm standing behind these two staffers. It's the end, close to the end of the day. And the one person says to the other one, well, I wanted to get this file out so I could mail it. So I just started copying every other page. And I literally wanted to take the pencil 
Like, how dare you not give that person the entire file because it was the end of the day? Like, I was yeah. so furious. I got out of the elevator. My face was just like, but it happens, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there could be any number of reasons why they didn't have it. Yeah. So always try again. You never know what answer you're going to get. Um, someone said that uh, their father was a naval officer during World War II, who was discharged after the war, re-upped a few weeks later, retired in October 1964. They submitted a request for his records through the electronic uh, veterans records, yeah. received a link to a copy of his two discharge forms and a note that they couldn't provide a complete record. Um, the link was only good for a month and it um, wouldn't let her download it. So she's wondering, why did they just send these two documents and why couldn't I download oh. them? And how can I get a complete copy? I'm sure they're very frustrated that, with that response. Oh, that's <laughs> rough. Yes, I have requested documents from the National Archives myself. I've had them digitize them. They've digitized them, they've scanned them, they've emailed them to me. And yes, they have an internal service instead of using like Dropbox or you know anything like that. And they are, they're only active for 30 days, but there's, I've always been able to download them. I've yeah. never had an issue where I haven't been able to download the file. And I apologize for that. If it were just the two pages, I probably would have just screenshotted them, <laughs> save them to my computer or use my phone and take a picture of it off my, off my computer. But yes, that's the internal service they have. And because they, they drill through things so often, you know, they'll, you know, they only keep it live for 30 days. Um, I could see why they would say they didn't have anything else because his service was still active after that particular date. Um, I would go in and I would fill out an e an EVET Rex request just for his World War II service. Because if he was discharged and his service ended and then he re-upped, they should at least be able to give you that first, that second World War collection. Um, so I would go in, instead of asking for the entire file all the way up to 1964, I would just ask for his Second World War service and see if they send that to you. Sometimes they do scan them and they just send you the link. You can ask for them to make a hard copy and mail you a hard copy. You can request that. There's there's no problem with that. Um, but then, yes, then I would probably call the records management division. Again, the other half of that building and ask them how you could get a copy of the rest of his service file. So I would split them in half. So at least you could start to request the first half. Cause like I had a soldier who served in the first and second world war. And every time I requested his file, all they sent me was the second world war. And, and no matter how many times I said, I don't want this one. Mm -hmm. I want first world war because he had the same service number in both military engagements. They only gave me the second one. Mm -hmm. wasn't until I finally talked to Holly, who's wonderful, talk to Holly at the archives in St. Louis, tell her what it is you're looking for, um, request the one, and then request the other from records management, not the archives. All right. Um, what about pictures? Is there usually a picture of a person in their military personnel file? We Plus wish. The Navy. <laughs> and even, yeah, and even with the Navy, it's not always 100%. Mm -hmm. But... Maybe you're more likely to get a photo of them in their service uniform. And in the army, I've never come across one. In the hundreds of army requests I've put in, I've never come across one. So, you know, maybe you'll get lucky if there's a Navy. And the funny thing is they come in their own little envelope, right? And they're like the negatives, right? So you're when you're scanning it or taking a picture of it, you're taking a picture of the negative. It's not even yeah. the, like the, the print of the photo that's oh. in there. Um, if someone was hired as a civilian overseas by the federal government, would those records also be at the record center? I don't know if they would be. They might be in the Department of State records. So, like, okay. again, if somebody's doing embassy duty or something like that. Those might be in the Department of State. That's kind of where, like, if somebody dies overseas as a citizen, they're not in the military. Just like if I have a heart attack in Paris. Right. Those go through Department of State, the State Department. All right. Um Back to the morning reports, did those capture things that happened when they were in basic training or other training before they were shipped out? I haven't looked. I've only ever looked at records once they're deployed. I would think basic training records might either be in um, those admin files um, as part of the unit's military service or the base. I can't recall if I've ever seen them as part of their morning reports once they're deployed. 
my gut says no they're going to be separate but i haven't looked for them so the potential is there but i've always only seen the records after they've already been deployed to we've left we've been given our orders and we're off um are there those morning reports for the navy also they're called something different what are they called Old age is killing me here. Um, I know there's lots of really great questions today. They do have something similar. They're not called the same thing. Um, for Bog Navy sheets, records, someone said. yeah, yeah, they, they have a different name, and I thank you because my brain was not pulling them up. Um, but the Navy would do um, what are called called cruise books, where basically they're like yearbooks for for each deployment, um, and they would have a lot of the day to day in those. Um, that would be a great uh, question for the naval historian. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't know, and I don't want to give you erroneous information. Um, are muster rolls and unit rosters online for World War II? Not a lot of them. I very few actually. the 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 World War II Museum in Louisiana, I think, had like bits and pieces. But there's there's really not a whole lot available for World War II yet. Most of what you're getting for World War II are casualty lists. Now, let me distinguish what casualty means if you're in, in the military. Casualty is accident, injury, death, or disease. So you could have caught measles. You're going to show up in a casualty list. You could have gotten a shrapnel wound to the tush like Dr. Raitan when I was in college. He always told us the story about being at Anzio Beach. Um, shows up in the casualty list versus those who are killed in action who show up in casualty lists. So, you know, the potential is there that you're going to have family that's going to show up in the casualty list because they caught German measles at Fort Riley when they were in basic training, like my first oral history interview, Mr. Kessich was, shows up in the casualty list. Um but as I have not really seen now, remember, um, Fold 3 has been digitizing some of these morning reports. So there are some, there's not a whole lot. I've not seen the sick reports and I've not seen a lot of the, the, the rosters yet, but potentially you might get lucky that there's some um, morning reports that are for that unit. Remember, they're not all online yet, but you might get lucky that there's some in there. All right. Um, this person said they're looking for a list for the Monfort Point Marines, which was a group of African Americans who enlisted at Jacksonville uh, between 19 Jacksonville, North Carolina, um, between 1942 and 1948, but they can't find a compiled list. Do you think morning reports might help identify these Marines? They might help identify some of them. I mean, it also might be worth it. What I guess the question would be what what company were they in within what unit? So that's where I might reach out to the National Archives in St. Louis and ask, or they might refer you to um, a researcher to go through those muster rolls and those monthly reports to, to look specifically for those men. Because like you saw in those ones that I was showing you, it's not giving you a whole lot of information, but it's at least giving me their name and their service number and their date that they joined that particular unit. So like if it's you know, the 313th company A, right? You've got something very specific that you can write to St. Louis and say, do you have the microphone reels for this time period for this particular unit? But um, the question would be what Marine unit, like what were they put into? What were they in machine gun? Were they in infantry? What was their designation? All right. Um, the next question, my deceased father's discharge paperwork shows U.S. Army. However, when he enlisted, his paperwork shows Army Air Force. So when you're filling out requests, which branch would you put on there? Because it must have been during that time on, period. Well, that, yeah, it would depend yeah. on, on when he's discharged. Um, I I would put the unit that he's discharged from. So if on his discharge papers they say this, that's what I'm going to put on his paperwork. But there's a link on the National Archives website. So if you go to archives.gov and you click on veterans records, um, the second bullet point down underneath the graphic is military medals requests. So you can fill that out, give them the information you have, and they should be able to tell you what he's eligible for. All right. 
Uh, let's see. My late mother was a lieutenant in the Army, 1944 to 45, and then transferred to the Veterans Administration, where she worked through 1949. Uh, where would her records be for her Army service and her VA work? Is the, Are those two separate requests, or can you request it and get all of the things? It's two requests. So I, I, would, I would fill out two of those OMPF forms that I showed you. Fill out the one for her military service, asking specifically for what she did at the time that she was the the year that she was um, in the military. And then I would use the exact same form and fill out the civilian side and put just that she worked for the veterans administration. If she worked in more than one facility, like if she worked, you know, in, in Detroit, and then she moved to, you know, Lansing, put them all down. Um, they might come back and say, we don't have the civilian records because the VA still has those records. Try it anyway. And then if they say, no, we don't have them, the VA has them, reach out to the state VA and ask if they have copies of it. All right. Um, what options, either in person, by mail, or online, are available to someone who is doing research for someone and they're not related to that family? In person. Because you're going to get way more information provided to you in person. And this is the kind of thing that I would say for anyone. Right. You can ask for records collection. So let's say outside of the cut and dry, I want their OMPF or I want their court martial case. Right. We can think on our feet better because we have more background knowledge than somebody who's going to be doing the searching for us. So if I send an email or I fill out a records re request, my brain might say when that record, when I'm looking at that record, oh, my goodness, this is the clue I needed. I now need to look at these three records somebody else can't do that thinking for you. So not everybody has the ability to, to go to the archives and do that research. But if, you know, like me, like I need POW records. I've got three different family members who are POW. I'm just making a list. And hopefully next year when I have the ability to go, I'm going to do it all at once. Um, but nobody, nobody can make connections and, and observations like you can. So I would always recommend in person first and foremost, if you can't do that, reach out to them and say, this is what I'm looking for. Can you provide it? And if they say, no, we can't, my last resort would be to contact a researcher and ask them to do it for me. Because the researcher's only going to pull what you ask for. They're not going to pull extra. Archive staff might, because they might know the collection well enough to say, you didn't ask for this, but I know these two things are related. Researcher might not know that. All right. Um, someone says, my dad was hospitalized after VE day in military hospital in Mar Marseille to deal with service related injuries. How can I get his medical records um, from 1945? The VA has nothing. That goes back to what I was saying about field hospitals. So general hospitals would be the, the hospitals in the rear, right? You would have your triage hospitals, those people who are injured right at the front of the battle, right? That Those are the closest. The field hospitals would be the second the general hospital would be the last. That's when you're looking for that, that casual information. He's coming back separate from his unit. He's going to be put into a casual unit on board a ship with a bunch of other guys who are discharged from that hospital all at the same time. So it's just a matter of finding out whether or not that particular hospital, that general hospital, if those records exist. Because again, there could be staff, there could be you know the, the nurses and the doctors, and then there could be um, patients. Right. They're two separate records collections. And it's just a matter of figuring out which one they might have. I'd start with College Park. That might not be, and same with the person who was asking about the field hospital, that might not be a bad request to submit to the history hub because it's going to go to, to archive staff, right? And it's going to get like shuffled off to the people who have experience with those particular collections and tell them, I don't need doctors and nurses, I need patients, or I don't need patients, I need doctors and nurses. And they might be able to tell you the record group and the date range and where to go to access those. Because they might be in Kansas City, but they might say, no, they're here in College Park. Here's how you can request them. They're, they're amazing. History Hub, if you haven't used it before, is really just an incredible service. Yeah, I just threw the link to it in the chat. So oh, again, you, we're we're have we're share the chat out with the recording as well. Let's see. Uh, my grandfather gassed in World War One in France just sixty days before the war's end. How terrible! Um, but where is the best place to research what happened to him? I would be looking for those war diaries. 
I would, cause I had somebody, my Angus was gassed and I'm still trying to prove whether or not it was true. He was the one that I was looking for the patients for that hospital. And I was looking for nurses for another, and they had the records reversed. They had the doctors, but not the patients. Um, they would be in the unit records. So not necessarily his um, OMPF, which is probably a fire record anyway, but in the unit. So if you know the unit, so if you know that it's the first balloon squad, or if you know it's the chemical warfare service or whatever it happens to be, the unit records for France are in um, record group 120. It's the AEF, it's the American Expeditionary Forces. Um, and they're done um, by unit. So if you know the unit, they're going to pull the files for you. Um, and in the unit, in the admin files, it might have some of that information about exactly what happened. Um, they do have some of those hospital records for overseas in France for the First World War. Like I said, I know they have them. They're just kind of incomplete. They don't have everybody um, that would give additional information. I'd look for the war diary. So I'd reach out to the First World War Museum in Kansas City and ask them if they have the war diary for that particular unit. I would be looking at newspaper reports. So every base in camp had its own newspaper. So whether it was Camp Dodge, whether it was Fort Dix, whether it was Camp Grant, every base in camp had its own paper. But then Stars and Stripes had a U.S. and an overseas edition. Overseas edition for Stars and Stripes are online. I believe they're in Ancestry. So I'd be looking through Stars and Stripes to see if there's any mention. Or the unit newspaper, if you could find it. Few are online. Um, Genealogy Bank has some. Chronicling America has some. Um, but woefully incomplete. Um, and see if you can see if somebody wrote a story about exactly what happened. I'm going to be looking through histories, you know, even from the top down, even something like Ken Burns, the war, right? Like I'm going to be looking for people who have written about that particular event. I would probably reach out to either the Army or Navy historian, depending on which branch of service they were in. If it's the Army, I might reach out to Carlisle and see if they have any information about it as well. So like there's levels, right? You got to think of it like a bullseye. I'm starting here, but I'm going to look here and here and here and here and see who might have a piece of that. But yes, I had some soldiers who were gassed too. Archives too in College Park has an immense photograph collection and their World War I Signal Corps collection is record group 111. So it's 111-WW and they had a lot of photos in that collection of gas victims. And some of them are horrifying, but like they photograph them front and back to show exactly what happened, what type of gas exposure wounds they had. So the potential is even there also that in the photograph collection in College Park, their, their Signal Corps photos, there might be, he might be mentioned in some of those too. All right. Um, did the family have to pay to have the remains returned home of someone who died? No. No, the army covered the cost. I think, I mean, I don't know about modern records, but when we're talking about first and second world war, the army picked up the tab. Now the family might have to pay the cemetery for the opening and closing of the grave and things like that, but they didn't have to pay to have the body returned to them. What they did with it once it was within their possession, they probably would have had to have paid for it. All right. Um, someone says uh, their husband requested a file for his father, but they're wondering if there's more materials in the papers on site than were sent um, digitally because, you know, that person had mentioned background information on the family. Um, would that background information be in his file because they didn't receive it in the digital copies they were given? Sometimes. So I, I have come across files that I've looked at where the family submitted information because it was a burn file and they mailed stuff back to the National Archives. Um, but it's not stuff that's military related. So they might not have copied it because it's not a, a official military personnel file, if that makes sense. This is extraneous information that was provided to them that is unverifiable to them. So the potential is there. Um, anytime I can go and look at something in person, I'm going to do it because Yes, it might have been inconsequential. And I had this happened to me with National Archives One. I had gotten a copy of my great grandfather's Civil War service, and they had sent me the front page of the document, but not the back page, the back side of it. And while it wasn't earth shattering, there was information on the back side that I was grateful to have once I looked at it in person. Wouldn't have changed a whole lot, but you know, you never know when somebody's going to feel that something's not pertinent and not yeah. included. 
it's worth a shot. Um, next question. My father was in the Quartermaster Corps in World War II and in charge of burials. Um, mm -hmm. Would the deceased files have any general information on the soldiers who were in charge of those burial arrangements? Not that I've seen. I mean, I've seen the name of the soldiers listed that had to accompany the body um, if it was returned to the family. That'll be listed in those files. But the like the burial detail files would be part of the unit files. So they're not going to be in with the individual deceased persons. They're going to be in with the unit files. So the potential is there that you're going to find that listed in the unit. And then again, the American Battle Monuments um, might have additional information in their collection, which is separate. They're still at National Archives, though. Um, someone's wondering if we know what caused that fire that happened in 1973. There's an article that was published last year. I have it like if you if you go out to my Facebook page and you scroll back because you could search, right? You go to my Tamarack genealogy and search on fire. Um, in the article, this lady wrote a really lengthy article talking about the fire and its aftermath. It's a phenomenal article. Um, and I want to say they thought it was arson. You know, like somebody had like flicked a cigarette or something into the garbage can and it caught fire and just, I mean... These records weren't, so think of like the hull of a ship, right? If if a boat is going down, you have the ability to close off the different portions so that the entire ship doesn't flood. They didn't have that in that building. Yeah. So there was nothing to break the fire from just rushing through the entire floor. Um, so and she talks about it. It's, it's a fascinating article. I highly recommend going and taking a look. Um, I can't remember the exact date that I posted it. It was about a year ago. Um, but it's probably the, one of the most outstanding articles I've ever read about it. I mean, I've read the Dry National Archives articles about, oh, the fire happened. Hers is written like a crime novel. Like it's, it's just, it's stunning. Like the anxiety you have reading this as she's talking minute by minute about how the fire is spreading. It's very well done. And um, someone asked, are any records that are available at that National Personal Records Center available on Fold 3? And they said most of them. <laughs> um, no. We wish. <laughs> slowly, but yeah, slowly but surely, like I said, the morning reports are starting to show up in there. That's the only thing so far that they've really made a concerted effort. Um, Archives 2 in College Park, like they did the, the transport lists. Um, so each one's trying to do what they feel would be the most bang for the buck. Um and let's admit it, it's kind of low hanging fruit. If I could just yeah. take a hundred microfilm reels and have you digitize them versus millions of pages of personnel records. Yeah, they're gonna start with with the smaller stuff. Yeah, what about like muster rolls, unit rosters, sick reports? You think those will be on fold three anytime I soon? I hope so. I hope so eventually. They haven't gotten there yet. Now I haven't seen an inventory of what they're gonna do next. Um, that might be on the archives webpage somewhere. There's a, a section on the archives webpage for citizen archivists. They might have a list of, you know, what they're thinking of doing next. But I think it's one of those things where, you know, we don't want to make the suggestion. We don't want to dangle the carrot from the stick and then change our minds. So I don't know how much um, headway they're going to tell us about until it's done. And look, we've done this. And now we're all excited. Yay. We've got... Eight more questions in 10 minutes, guys. Let's do it. Um, so uh, employment oh, records. You guys are in it to win it. Employment records for those who worked for national parks. Those would be at the National I Personal would, Records yeah, Center. I would submit a request. Yeah. Okay. I would still send a request to the individual park, too. Because, I mean, each park has its own archives, if you didn't realize yeah. this. You know, like, you know, Gettysburg has its own archives. You know, Fort Pulaski, you know, Yellowstone, they all have their own archives. So it doesn't hurt to ask them for information too. But yeah, I would submit a an employee request, a citizen employee request. Okay. Um, their father came back from World War II on Queen Elizabeth, arriving in New York Harbor on January 1st, 1946. They're wondering, how do I find other members of his unit? They have the unit number that were traveling with him on that ship. They should have all come back together unless they were separated in casual units. Um, I'd look for the the war diary because the clerk's going to keep track, right? Because before they let everybody off ship, they have to check mark that they're not AWOL, right? They've got to keep track of people as they're coming and going. The unit records would have that too, because before everybody is mustered out, 
right? And everybody is, is released from their military service. They've got to have a roster of everybody who's in the unit. So um, once they are stateside, those records are at Archives One again, right? Only the records for when they're overseas, like they board the boat in Brest and they're, they're coming back, right? Once they step off into New York City or into Fort Dix or whatever it is, those become Archive One records again. So you might want to look for the archives too for the um, unit reports of them while they're still overseas because they've got to keep an inventory of every single man who's on that ship. But besides just that, now, if you were looking for First World War, it'd be easy. I'd tell you to go to Fold 3 and look at the transport lists. Um, for World War II, there would be the exact same thing, but they're not online yet. So the transport list is going to have everybody who's on board that ship, and it's going to be two sheets of paper. It's going to be everybody who's on board that ship, and then the next of kin of everybody who's on board that ship. Because if that ship goes down, there's a lot of people they got to contact. Yep. So they would know exactly who was on board. But because they're not online yet, you're going to have to reach out to archives too. All right. Um, someone says, after his discharge from the Army in World War II, my dad was hospitalized with an Army-related illness in Castle Point, New York. Would there be records available on that? Um, and because it was an Army-related thing, do you think that would be in his file, or would it be separate because it was, you know, a hospital? Maybe. So I know with some military records, the potential is there. That if it was an army related disability, and I'm forgetting what the acronym is right now over the top off the top of my head, um, and he would have been eligible for pension, then they would have kept that information. But here's the downside. On 90% of the discharge papers that you would file with your county when, when you get out of the service, it says discharged in good health. And that negated so many people from being eligible to claim pension. Well, Army said you were in good health. Sorry, buddy, this happened after the fact. We have nothing to do with it. So that's when I would look for state records, check state adjutant general's records, check state VA records to see if he had filed a claim um, through the state, through the veterans, um, through the VA, through the Veterans Administration. That's probably where I would start. All right. Um, someone says this person went to Canada before U.S. entered the World War II and received their pilot's wings, joined the RAF, and then um, they joined the Army Air Corps when the U.S. entered war. Uh, what suggestions do you have for finding records on them? Canadian records are phenomenal, and they're available online, and they're free. So if you go out to the Canadian State Archives, um, it's dual language. So it's, you know, Archives Canada in French and English. Um, their military records are already digitized and available online. So you don't even have to do like the lengthy process we have to do. They're readily available. So you should and be able to find them. Then they would also request the U.S.-based yes. records. As yes. Well. But at least the Canadian ones, like you'd have right away. Yeah. Like awesome. you'd feel like, look at this. Look at how easy this is. <laughs> it, and, they make it look so easy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the U.S. is really behind because, you know, Canada, Australia, the U.K., they've already put their records online. They've already done it. And we're still in the Stone Ages. Yeah. Um, what about replacement medals? So someone said World War II, um, you know, they have a list of what awards and medals, pins, et cetera, they got, um, but they found none of the things um, that were passed down. So can you get replacements? Yes. You're going to go to that same link on the National Archives website. You're going to go to the veterans link, the second one from the left. You're going to scroll down. You're going to click on replacement medals. Um, what about a silver star? Um, so they're wondering, where would I get information on just what action um he received that sil silver star for in world war ii it should be in his personnel file um because any any medals that you're awarded so like if you receive the purple heart because you take a, a bullet wound to the shoulder all of that should be included in your file um there might be separate I'm trying to think of what the record group would be if it would be adjutant in general's records um, there might be a separate record group for like silver stars, bronze stars, because um, like there's a whole website for Medal of Honor recipients and it's separate paperwork that you request because they have to do like a lengthy um, dossier on the event and the person and in, 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 um, what happened. I don't know if they would have to go into that much detail for silver stars, um, but it might very well be listed 
in the um, the unit records in the admin records within the unit and in the war diary. Yeah, Linda shared in the chat, there was a letter in her dad's file um, for what his bronze star was from Vietnam. So you never know, it might be in the file uh, mm -hmm. if you haven't gotten that yet. Two more questions, we can do it. All right, um, I can't remember if these have been answered before or something similar, mm -hmm. um, but someone asked about World War II records um, for the Army Air Force. Be, are mm -hmm. those separate from regular Army records uh, in that World War II era, kind of before the Air Force was official? Or no, not until after 1947. Army. Yeah, you're still going to request them under Army. And you'll even notice on some forms, it says Army, Army Air Corps slash Air Force. Like, you know, so they recognize based on the date for the records you're requesting, which set of records they're going to pull. But yes, it'd be Army Air Corps before 1947. All right. And the final question, uh, do they have records for the nurse cadet corps? Um, they've seen the cards on Ancestry, but they're wondering where they would get additional information. We're talking about World War II. They did not um, say. Yes. Again, kind of like in the same place where you would find the 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 waves, you know, the Women's Auxiliary Corps, the you know, the Army Air Corps, like the Women's Air Corps, um, Navy records. Um, Did they actually finish and get deployed is my question for the nursing cadets. That would probably be a history hub question. I would All probably right. ask them, see if they have specific details that they could provide. Well, thanks everyone for hanging in here. We are about to close the I, library and I can't believe goodness, how many you questions guys. you answered, Tina. You are just an absolute rock star. So many people in the chat commented how amazing you are and how incredible you are and that it was A few people long. took like bio breaks, like poor Katie's <laughs> like had to listen to me ramble on. Holy cats. Yeah, they usually don't go this long, but you know, sometimes you get a really great topic and we had so many wonderful questions. So you thank you everyone. Video up for... into like the presentation and then the Q&A. Right, no kidding. <laughs> um, but thank you everyone for hanging in here. Hopefully those who had to leave early, you can catch the recording and watch uh, your question be answered because it took so long to get through all of them. But thanks oh my everyone goodness. You guys are amazing. for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> uh, again, we invite you to join us next month, uh, Saturday, November 9th, when we're going to talk about social security records and how those might break down your brick walls. So again, check out that link in the handout to register for that. And again, thank you so much. Tina, you are just a wealth of information. Um, and even you guys more than me. Earn me. You make me learn so much. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't get to a question, please feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to dig a little deeper and try to provide whatever else might not have been answered today. So thank yeah. you all. And thank you, Katie. And you guys are amazing. I can't believe you hung in there that long. Go yeah, have some dinner. Enjoy. We still have a lot of people on here, about 80 people. So some people <laughs> stuck to the end. You guys are awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Right, I everyone. appreciate it. Everybody enjoy the rest of your weekend. Take care.